All right, so chat, today uh, I saw a video from a certain Josh Strife Hayes. And Josh and me, we got, we're, we're, we're best buds, best friends. You know, we, 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 we fought together, we go way back. And by way back, I mean I've DM'd him on at least two occasions. So I slipped into the DMs and I was like, Josh, buddy, pal, friendo, I would like to do some really scummy React content with one of your videos. Because I think I know a lot on this topic and I would love to talk about it. I just think it'd be fun. If you want it, you can literally have the revenue that the video makes just to show my sincerity. And, uh, however, uh, I know how you feel about React content, chat. Uh, he's basically said, uh, in the past on numerous occasions that he has mixed feelings about it. Because he himself blew up almost overnight on YouTube when, now he was already making great content, but no one knew who he was. And Asmongold watched some of his videos and he, you know, it got a lot of eyes on him and his channel blew up. However, he also feels kind of weird about it because, you know, he might put a hundred hours into making a video and then someone else reacting to it takes five minutes and they don't have to put in much effort for it. So he has mixed feelings about that. So I asked him, I was like, hey, I would like to do this, but if you don't want me to do this, I won't. But to show my sincerity, I'll give you the, re you know, any revenue I get while I'm doing it just to uh, show you that I just want to do this because I think it'd be fun. And he messaged me back and he's like, if you think you got something to add, you go right ahead and I thank you for asking. Also, you're very handsome. He may or may not have said that last part. I don't know. I was starstruck. So here we are. Uh, he had made a video and it's a little video that is called I Played EverQuest for 100 Hours. Should you? So for my very first time ever, I'm going to swap into the EverQuest section of Twitch. And, but the reason for that is I myself played EverQuest for seven years. So, I would like to show you guys a blast from my childhood. For people who already know me right now, I'm currently known as one of the biggest Guild Wars 2 creators, uh, Guild Wars 2 content creators uh, on the platform. Rise of Kunark, the strategy guide, chat. I had the strategy guide. You know, one of the reasons that the uh, strategy guide was so great is this game did not have any mucking maps in the game. So you needed paper maps next to your desk. All right, I have got so many of the CDK. Look at this. Look, this one even came with the uh, an action figure. The girl, she's still in the box. Never got her out of the box. But uh, we have got all the CDs and stuff here. I was a Guild Wars 2 nerd for seven years. That was when uh, my dad would say I began my fall. And we are going to watch this and uh, check it out because I want to. So, uh, also really quickly, if you've not seen the original video. I would encourage you to watch the original video uh, to see it from Josh. Give him a, uh, a view, all that good stuff. I am going to link it in my own video down below and then come back and see my side afterward. That way he gets his support. Uh, okay, with that, without further ado, I played EverQuest for 100 hours, should you? Let's see if spending 100 hours inside a 25 year old MMORPG was a good idea. Whenever I play or review any MMORPG game, hardcore long time fans of that game keep saying it gets good about 100 hours. In I almost forgot that I am abnormal and I watch YouTube on 2x speed. I'm gonna slow, slow it down to like 1.25. Let's see if spending 100 hours inside a 25 year old <laughs> MMORPG was a good idea. Whenever I play or review any MMORPG game, hardcore longtime fans of that game keep saying it gets good about 100 hours in. But let's be real, if a game hasn't grabbed you in the first hour, 10 if you're being generous, you're not going to keep playing. Okay, I have had this exact thing happen. Uh, not too long ago, I tried out Final Fantasy XIV. And I played it for, I think, 11 hours. I, I played it like on a, a Saturday. Well, we were streaming it like the whole day. And I, I had to stop. And so many people were like, no, Muck, don't do the beginning. Skip to, uh, d skip to, uh, you know, Shadow Feet. Skip to, uh, Heaven's Dagger or whatever it's freaking called. They're like, the, don't do, don't play the beginning. And I was like, well, I, I don't want to skip anything. I want to see the whole thing. And then I played it for 11 hours from the beginning. And I was like, this sucks. This is awful. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm sure it gets better later, but even longtime Final Fantasy fans that were contacting me are like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's a great game later, but the beginning is awful. And uh, they, I couldn't get into it. I couldn't get into it. But they're like, if you play it for 50 hours or 60 hours or 70 hours, or you buy the subscription and, and you reach the Heaven's Bow, and then you get your ascendancy and your subclass, and then you win the lottery, it gets really good. And I'm just like... So I have to buy the game and pay for a monthly subscription and hit level 100 to see if I'm going to like it. I'm not willing to do that. Anyway, I'm just saying I get this too. Who in their right mind even has 100 hours free to get into a game they might not even enjoy? Hello, I'm Josh Drive Hayes. I'm going to play Ever... Off topic, I love how he's combined his habit of holding a mug with his habit of speaking into a microphone. Quest for 100 hours to see if it gets good. 
I finished quests, geared up, and had a chat with some of the most enfranchised players. I've played on both a live server and a time lock progression server over multiple classes for a total of 100 hours. So really quickly here, uh, to pause and talk on that. So, um, regular server, uh, he's going to touch on this throughout his video, but the regular EverQuest server uh, is just like playing retail WoW or modern Guild Wars 2. It has all the expansions, 29 of them, and you're all caught up. You've got everything. Time lock progression is like you're playing the game as it launched when it first came out, no expansions, and then maybe after a month or two, the first expansion releases. Then after a month or two, the second expansion releases. So like you're all on there. You're, you're basically just a horde of people that are just reliving the glory days are there. And they're all kind of leveling together like in a wave. So the good part about joining a time lost, uh, sorry, a time locked progression server really early on is you're in that wave and it's easy to find groups for any form of content as you're leveling up because that's where the whole population is. The bad thing is, is if you join later, if you join later, it's really hard to catch up. But on retail, you know, everybody is at the top. So similar issue, but they're not going anywhere because they're already at the top. You just got to level up and catch up to them and then you're, and then you're there was to see if EverQuest, as it is today, is worth your time. Before we begin a mass- Corey says, Bad News Muck, you're no longer the most handsome content creator I've ever seen. Yes, but I am the, uh, the React streamer for Josh Drive Hayes that has the best hairline. Thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep this channel alive. Long form videos like this take hundreds of hours to make and are a big risk. So it's only through your support that I can keep making them. More information on how you can support at the end. So for now- Um, yes, patrons are awesome. And uh, Josh inspired me to make my own list. No, just saying. It's a, it, they're, they're good people. They're good people. Oh, let's begin our adventure in the lands of Norath. Norath is the name of the planet in the EverQuest series. That's the world. 100 hours into perspective, studies show that the average gamer will play between 1 to 2 hours a day, between 10 to 15 hours a week. Now, back when we were kids, playing 8 to 10 hours a day sounds absolutely fine. No problem at all. But as we get older, responsibilities... Mm, it doesn't sound fine. It sounds weak. I can do way better. <laughs> Family, jobs, and other hobbies mean most players struggle to find even one to two hours a day. So playing for a hundred hours is about the same as playing for two hours a day for a... That is something that you see a lot in gaming culture. Have you guys ever seen, like, Diablo 4 recently? D4 came out, and there were so many, like, big streamers and stuff that after, like, three days were like, Oh, there's nothing to do. There's no content left. Oh, this game sucks. And it was like... Uh, my friend, you just blasted. Th you, you haven't slept in three days. You just played 36 hours of nonstop content. While I wish there was more to do in Diablo 4, um, the average gamer, 90% of their player base, is going to take a month to get to where you are right now. Okay? You've got to understand you don't represent the majority. Okay? It's something I have to tell my coworkers in streaming sometimes too. Like, we're very blessed that we get to play a lot of games. That's not the standard. Around two months if you were to have weekends off or occasionally take a break, provided you don't get bored, which with EverQuest, you likely will. 100 hours is enough time to watch the entire- That sounded like just like a, a slam at EQ. It is also kind of true. He, again, he will touch on this throughout this very long video, but in EverQuest, there was a lot of downtime, okay? I, imagine in any game, like every six seconds, you heal for one health. If you're sitting, you heal for two health. Imagine you're playing a class that doesn't have a healing spell. So if you're a warrior and you fight an enemy and you kill it, you might have to sit down for minutes to get your health back. God help you if something attacks while you were sitting and you weren't in a safe spot. Because if you get attacked while you're sitting, you guarantee you get hit with a critical strike. There was a lot of downtime back then, which is why it was such a social game. You spent a lot of time talking to people and making friends and stuff like that. Um, but in this day and age, it's, uh, it's, t it's easier to fill that time by tabbing out of the game and doing something else. Tire extended Lord of the Rings trilogy eight times to finish Morrowind without fast travel or to beat the PS2 pile of rubbish without fast travel. The bouncer 250 times. The idea that somebody has to play a game for 100 hours for it to be worth their time or to have a valid opinion on it is ludicrous, but we are here now, so we may as well do it. So grab a drink and settle in for a 100 hour review of EverQuest. Quick warning, this video features spiders, snakes, and very, very large insects. Let's start with some- very kind of him to do the arachnophobic warning and whatever the other phobias are called. Really short story. There's a zone in EverQuest called the Southern Desert of Row. There's a rare spawn. EverQuest like to do this thing where let's say you've got a zone with level 10 mobs. Once a day, a boss that was level 50 would spawn in the zone and just rampage around. 
<laughs> and all the low level people would be like, you know, guildies, come here quick. <laughs> and they would come and like take care of this thing. The Southern Desert of Roe, there was one called Terrorantula. And it was a spider whose legs were the size of the trees there. So you would be walking along at normal human height and all of a sudden one of the trees next to you would lift up. And you'd be like, what? And it'd be the biggest spider you've ever seen. There was a few stories of people that basically just had panic attacks and fell out of their computer chair frothing at the mouth because this thing just snuck up on them. Some history. EverQuest was released all the way back in 1999. You had that iconic box art with the EverQuest girl, or as fans will insist, you call her Elven Princess Firiona Vi. Firiona Vi. Yeah. Originally made by Verint Interactive. She, she's just for people who don't play the game. She's a character in the game. She's like a demigod or something. It's been a long time. Uh, but she's like a demigod, and she is a character that occasionally you run into the NPC of her. Um, but yeah, she's on the box art of every single. Like, hold on. I've got a few of them here. Uh, like this was. This was the core game. There's Fury on a Vi. This is Scars of Velius. There's Fury on a Vi. And here's Ruins of Kunark, where lizard people apparently are into bondage because there's Fury on a Vi. And we're not going to talk about that. And 989 Studios and released by Sony Online Entertainment. These companies have merged and split several times and were ultimately renamed to Daybreak. Daybreak today are responsible for maintaining EverQuest 1 and 2, DC Universe Online, Planetside 2, Dungeons and Dragons Online, and Lord of the Rings Online. So they. Oh my gosh. Uh, I remember when Planet Side came out. Uh, it's for Sony Online Entertainment. We, we had EverQuest and Planet Side. We were eating good. Clearly understand MMORPGs. But here's a fascinating thing. Despite being released in 1999, EverQuest 1 is not only still alive, but still actively being updated and added to. In fact, it currently has 29 expansions with a 30th. So just to give it my own, uh, my own like story here, I joined the game in Ruins of Kunark, and I played so much Kunark, Velius, Lucklin, uh, Planes of Power. I was not active when Legacy of Akisha came out. I uh, came back just after Lost Dungeons of Norath. I played some of Gates of Discord, and then just about everything else here was after my time. <laughs> releasing in December of 2023. Now, EverQuest like used to years. be a monthly sub-game, but back in 2012, it went free to play. It's available through the Daybreak launcher or through Steam. And so yeah, uh, monthly sub, it was $15 a month. Um, when World of Warcraft came out, they said that EverQuest was the titan at that time. Like if you played an MMO, you either played EverQuest or maybe Dark Age of Camelot, uh, you know, DAOC. You, it was one of those two, but it was three quarters chance you played EverQuest if you played an MMO at that time. World of Warcraft, came out uh, later on with the, at the same time, uh, the same month that uh, EverQuest 2 came out. Um, Free play sub game, so but back the, in 2012. The sub fee thing, uh, you could say that, wow, you know, got that idea and saw, they saw how good this was doing or like, oh shoot, we want a slice of that pie. Free to play. It's available through the Daybreak launcher or ah, through Steam. And free too, yeah. players get 27 of the 29 expansions. That is a lot of content. Now, most players agree it's not. Yeah, so EverQuest has always done this insane thing like literally from their second expansion on, where if you bought the newest expansion, it gave you all the others for free. That was so cool of them to do that. Like, you know, uh, Ruins of Kunark came out. And then when Scars of Elias came out, anyone who bought Scars got Ruins of Kunark for free. When you bought the 28th expansion, you got the first 27 for free. And on and on and on all good content but there's certainly a lot of it there is also an optional monthly sub but we'll look at that a bit later because it can be a bit predatory now on steam you'll see it's called everquest free to play but this is the full game that you can get membership in as well the first challenge of wanting to play everquest is working out which version you should play so let's just break it down on the current live game you've got normal servers with no special rules like antonius bale i use this one it's basically the live game with every expansion and when a new expansion comes out it will be added here first but you've also got members servers like the fury Vi role-playing server with boosted experience and free trade of normally untradeable items but every race only knows its starting language and you can't talk to others unless you learn their language in game but then so that is actually a really cool system um when i played it there was normal and rp and pvp servers and the rp servers were how can i put this i knew very few people who actually role played but the gms were stricter there like if you had a, a character named pop tart there a gm would appear and make you change your name because it wasn't an rp name which sounds silly now, but they tried to make it a, an experience where you could be more like immersed in the world. Um, the RP thing with the languages was actually wild. You, what you would do is, let's say you made a, uh, a, a gnome character, you would know the gnomish language. If you made an elf, you would know elvish and so on. There was no common tongue. The normal servers had a common tongue language. 
Um, so basically, if you started t typing in chat and you're like, I like cheeseburgers, and you say it in Gnomish and the other guy doesn't know Gnomish, the computer would scramble the letters. And every time you read a message you couldn't understand, you had a chance of increasing your skill in that language. And after uh, your skill went up, the, it would scramble it less and less and less until you could start to make it out. So low level groups of people of different races were such a joy. It was, you were playing charades. Like you would be, you would be doing emotes like jump, jump, point, point, nod, nod, jump, jump, point. No, don't go that way. You know, you'd be trying to tell people like, you know, incoming 50 orcs were going to die, you know, by jumping up and down and doing emotes and stuff like that. Because when you typed, it was just blah, 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 and, and no one could understand each other. And on the flip side, you would have group uh, language circles where you'd get a group of people and they were sitting in a circle in town and they literally just got a paragraph of text, like the tragedy of Darth Plagius the Wise. They put it on a hotkey and they were just going, and they were just like spamming the hotkey and basically just blasting each other with text spam. And it was just whizzing past on their screen. They could see nothing but just garbage, but they were getting skill ups and learning like five languages at a time. They would get like a gnome, a dwarf, an elf, and like an ogre in a circle, and they would all just be screaming at each other until like their languages went up. It was a very fun experience. And because the GMs were stricter on those servers, there was almost like no trolls or like really bad conduct. Um, and I, I enjoyed a lot. I have a lot of fun memories from the RP servers, even though I don't know anyone who RP'd. Few months, meaning you can basically play the game from the start to the end, experiencing a new expansion as they would have been. With I think progression. I Recently we've seen now. two shortened to TLP. And mm -mm. No special rules like Antonius Bear. This I use this we one. It's basically the live game with every expansion, and when a new expansion comes out, it will be added here first. But you've also got members servers like the Firiona Vi roleplaying server with boosted experience and free trade of normally untradeable items. But every race only knows its starting language, and you can't talk to others unless you learn their language in game. But then you've also got servers called Time Locked Progression, shortened to TLP. And these are usually the most popular for a short time whenever they release. Recently, we've seen two progression servers added every year. Each can have a slightly different, unique rule set, but basically, a progression server launches as EverQuest Vanilla with no expansion and then expansions are added every few months, meaning you can basically play the game from the start to the end, experiencing a new expansion as they would have been, which keeps the player base focused and when an expansion unlocks, everyone's there, which makes grouping easier. The problem with progression servers is most players will play them until the first few bad expansions and then jump on whatever new progression server opens up. This means your chances of seeing a consistent group of players from the very start to the very end is actually incredibly low. Yeah, so think of any game that you've enjoyed in the past where it had a bunch of expansions and one of them you didn't care for. And just imagine when the wave of players gets there and then they're like, all right, we're done. And then they hop to a way, another server where it's starting over again. You know, they're like, oh, we're uh, we're, we're getting to, wow, Cataclysm? Ah, I didn't like Cataclysm. And then they just, they, they bail ship and they get onto another server that's on WoW Classic and then they start the whole process again. Uh, and some will stay, but most of the wave has moved on. Now, some of these servers are known as true box servers, meaning only one instance of EverQuest can be run at a time, and you cannot multi-box, which is something very important that we'll look into later. Because many people will tell you you're not playing EverQuest properly unless you're playing EverQuest six times at the same time. Now, there is also Project 99, an official... Multi-boxing, he's going to touch on this, uh, but multi-boxing is a thing that was just coming into fruition when I started playing. Uh, a lot of people know what multi-boxing is now, where you've got one person that may be alt-tabbed, or maybe there's different machines, but they have got... They're controlling a whole party. You know, they've got a whole party of people uh, and, and they're controlling all of them. Um, and it's not AI. It's like, you know, they have to like either alt tab between them to fire spells or maybe they've got something that just replicates a key. Like they hit one and then all the other characters in the party hit one also. Something like that. But multi-boxing has become something that um, EverQuest sort of allows and on some servers because some people uh, like to just control a whole party and they pretend that instead of it's an MMO, they pretend they're playing like a team builder game. And at the same time, they're also playing this, paying the subscription fee five to ten times. So Sony's like, okay, well, I guess it's Daybreak now. Officially endorsed private server of EverQuest as it was in 1999 with the first two expansion packs, the Ruins of Kunark and the Scars of Elias. But getting Project 99 running requires that you own the Titanium Edition, which they don't even sell anymore. Getting Project 99 running is a task that the average gamer isn't going to go through. So I will play that version at some point, but not in this video. 
So with live, live role-playing, live members, progression, and Project 99, the player base is fragmented. Steam Charts put the free version at about 500 daily players, and I'm sure there are a few more logging in through the Daybreak launcher. And Project 99 doesn't give exact numbers, but people estimate about one to 2,000 daily players. You've got a few content creators on YouTube putting out guide videos and Let's Plays, but I think it helps to come to terms quickly with this. EverQuest is still alive, but it's not the titan it once was. For this so for people who weren't uh, gaming back then, to really understand the titan it once was, imagine, like... <sighs> How big and WoW is known of is known for now. That was the EverQuest then. Maybe not in the same numbers, but it's like if you had a friend that got into MMOs, he probably played EverQuest. There was a chance of DAOC or Ultima, but it was probably EverQuest. Like that. That was the big one. That was the huge thing video I'll start off trying a live server with all the expansions and then a time locked progression server to see if I can feel a difference in both gameplay and community. So let's start with live. Character creation. 16 races from humans to frogs, furries to scalies, and interestingly barbarian is a race not a class. Funny enough for me you know it's now like 20 years later and the only that was that draken that is there's only one race there I don't recognize which is that bottom right one. Race choice effects. That thing stats and then 16 classes from standards like clerics rogues and warriors to more out there gameplay stars like necromancer or bards thankfully each class has a little bit of text explaining their solo viability because while everquest is very much built around being in a group with the very sparse player base you'll be alone a lot i'm going with a draken shadow knight a tanky spellcaster with self-healing and damage over time abilities should be able to solo but if i group up i should be useful as a tank you'll also yeah shadow knights are pretty interesting uh usually guy with a big two-hand sword kind of like a wild death knight um, but it's, they do get access to the same spells that necromancers get, but at later levels. So at like level nine, a shadow knight will get access to like some level one and level four necromancer spells. So like they even have a skeleton pet they can summon, but it's way weaker for their level than a necromancer's uh, skeleton pet is for their level. Um, but then of course they're a uh, melee powerhouse. Also, they are the opposite of a paladin. Many people who have played a game that had a paladin uh, may remember a skill called Lay on Hands. Even Dungeons and Dragons has it. Lay on Hands is usually like a very long cooldown. In EverQuest, it was like either once every 45 minutes or once, once a day. They could use it and just do, it's a full heal. No matter the target's level, it's a full heal. Um, Shadow Knights were the opposite of that. They had a skill called Harm Touch. They, once a day, could hit someone with it and it just, it was like hitting them with a truck. <laughs> it was just like here i'm gonna introduce you to god same day shipping but it was like once a day that you could do that hello neavalar uh so he's basically going to play a warrior with some life stealing abilities and a few dark magic options so notice no matter what you choose you start in a place called crescent's reach different races and classes used to have different starting areas and on progression servers they still do but in 2006 the 12th expansion the serpent's spine brought with it a new race and combined all of the starting points of all of the races to crescent's reach so new players are effectively all grouped up but before we reach mainland we so yeah, the, uh, as he said, the original game as I played it did not have this. Um, I did dabble in EQ a few times on Steam uh, since this came out. Um, this is actually an awesome tutorial. Because if you're playing the game, there's not a lot of people in the starting area. It's kind of just like, okay, here you go. Good luck. And you have no idea what to do. This tutorial area is actually amazing for the game. It was a great addition. We've got the tutorial zone, the Mines of Glooming Deep. We get a quick plot breakdown about how we've been captured and sent to the mines, and this will never be relevant again. So here we go. Now, strange it's touch, true. whenever you log in, you always start fully zoomed in in first person mode. The mouse wheel scrolls back, WASD movement, spacebar jumps. To talk to an NPC, you must left click on them and then press H on the keyboard for hail. After hailing an NPC, you'll see their chat in the main chat box to the bottom. No speech bubbles here. And any conversation options that could continue a conversation will appear in blue text in square brackets all right so this was a big thing they the uh there was no quest log chat if you were doing a quest for someone you were using a pen and paper or notepad to keep track of where you were it's like you go up to some npc they didn't have an exclamation point and you just hit h and be like hail and they'd be like oh hey, blah, 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 blah. man we are having a big problem with bandits and bandits would be in brackets and you're supposed to be like, oh, how can I help with the bandits or something like that? But the player base very quickly found out that you could just say anything with that word that ended with proper punctuation. So people, it dude, it devolved into people just going like, man, fuck bandits, and, you know, exclamation point. And the NPC is like, right? Yeah. So anyway, they're over that way. Kill 20, bring me back their hair you know, or something like that. And it would work. But as long as you responded with the keywords and some punctuation, they would continue the conversation. But again... No quest log. So you had to keep track of like, all right, uh, Billy Bob in the uh, town of Kelethan on the third platform by the elevator wants 10 dead bandits. Go back and talk to him when I've done that. You'd, you'd write that down. 
within the text box itself. Modern players, of course, may be used to separate text boxes or speech bubbles or very easy to see progression options. Not here. Have fun squinting and reading everything and clicking the blue choices. Also, remember what you clicked because if you have to go back and do the conversation again, it won't remind you what you've clicked on before. If a choice would lead to a quest being started, it will open the task window where you can read the quest and click accept. Apart from the So I don't know which expansion they added the task window in. Great change wasn't there for at least the first five or six expansions. A few times when it doesn't and just gives you the task straight away, and I can't tell why this does or doesn't happen. The quest window is bound to Alt-Q. I press Escape to open the menu and it doesn't. Escape just closes all the windows. All of your options are instead found by clicking the little EQ logo. So we're on a task and can see the steps needed. Kill the Jailer, take the key. This means combat. Left click on an enemy, then activate auto attack, which is bound to one. So behold, combat. <laughs> You'll notice there were no health numbers above the enemy. So a couple of things there. Uh, Shadow Knights have all the same skills as a warrior up until ninth level. Then they get some necromancer skills. Hey, uh, is it your bedtime? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to tell the boy goodnight. Give me just a sec. All right, so... All they have is auto attack. Uh, if you're a Guild Wars 2 player, just think of like, you know, just the one key auto attacking. That's all they have until level nine. Uh, and then they get some Necromancer spells added to the Shadow Knight. The Warrior only has auto attack for like 20 or 30 levels. It's a long time, chat. Warrior at low levels was so dull. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, you basically auto attack. And, uh, he also pointed out the numbers above the heads thing. Even WoW didn't have that at the beginning. Uh, that was, um, there was a very commonly downloaded add-on in WoW called Scrolling Combat Text, or, uh, SCT. And it was so popular that WoW ended up it just including it in the base game after a few versions of the game. It wasn't there originally. Um, but yeah, EverQuest did not have, uh, numbers above heads enemies heads just percentages and we'll take a look at that later with the jailer dead we loot a key from their corpse and need to give the key to arius to escape this prison and by give i mean you need to open your inventory click the key to select it then cursor over arius click arius then choose give trading all right so cool thing about this let's say you're doing a quest where you want to get really high level armor and you have to take like a mold and a mithril ingot and i don't know 50 gold and you have four things and you got to give them to an npc if you have a friend turn in three of them and then you turn in the fourth right after you'll get the reward the npcs would track okay since the last time i've given this reward out i have been given these things and whoever completes the set would get the reward so sometimes you could just get a reward without having the whole thing or like if you're doing a, a quest where you need four bind on pickup items to turn in but your friend picked up one of them and was like, oh, hey, don't you need this? You can just get the other stuff. They turn in their bit, you turn in the rest of the bits, and then you'll get the reward from the uh, the NPC. Being with NPCs is a major mechanic, and they will not notice that you have the item on you through regular conversation. You must manually hand things to them. With this done, we are teleported to the main mine camp, arriving in the traditional way of face first in someone's crotch. I mess around with rescaling the <laughs> UI and discover to leave the game, you must choose- Dude, how short are dracons? Wood elves are like 4'11". Like, wood elves are short. This is a wood elf. Dragons are like gnomes or something. Camp and quit down here where you'll sit down for 30 seconds before the game closes. And fun fact, whenever the game client does close, if you are not a monthly paying member, it will automatically open a browser window showing you all the monthly prices asking you if you want to become a member. And this happens every- At least it doesn't pop up when you're looking at your mini map, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Every single time. So this entire mine area is basically a big tutorial and following it through will get you some items, some armor and some weapons. We need to help all the other slaves escape. We now have two new tasks, meaning I need to find some NPCs, but this leads to one of the greatest features in any game ever, the find window. Control F opens the find window, listing every NPC in your current zone. Click on one of them to create a magical floating tube between you and them and then just Donnie Darko your way to them. Honestly, the find function is fantastic and makes navigation way easier. Wasn't in the base game. They added it after a couple of expansions and yeah, it was a huge hit. It's a, it's a little clunky, but it basically, there's like a glowing thread between you and whoever you're looking for, and you just follow it. In the future, we'll see a more complicated version of this using the map where you can find your way from map to map. The only issue is, while the find mode is active, you cannot zoom in or out of the minimap. So let's just look at the minimap. It is lines. This is the map. Multiple levels can be shown at once, but in different colors, meaning if you don't know which floor is which, it can be a bit confusing. But it's functional, at least. And don't worry, I'll be downloading a new map pack and improving this later. Give my All right, so really quickly, on the topic of the map here. When the game launched, and for many expansions after, there was no maps at all. 
there was a website that most of us use called EQ Atlas, and you could download... Wait, hold on. This strategy guide has a couple of them. Uh, let me see here. EQ Atlas, you could download uh, some... Okay, here we go. Here's, here's some uh, hand-drawn maps in here of uh, cities and like points of interest, like where the merchants are, things like that. And you could download maps. Chat, I use so much of my dad's printer paper. I had I printed out maps of every single zone in the game and had them in like alphabetical order in a stack on my desk. And any time I would be like in that zone, I would flip to that map and I'd be like, all right, I need to go here. So I need to go like south by southeast and then a little to the right. Okay, auto run. Yeah, and it was it was the only way to get around because there was no map in the game. So you, you had like a compass type ability called sense heading, and you could use that to kind of tell if you were facing south or east or whatever. And then you also had the, uh, the paper maps and you would use that to get around. Now, then they added an update where they added this screen. Like you could hit M to open map. It was blank. You had to draw it yourself. They literally provided us with parchment paper. And, but you could go, and so like, I remember I started to like f draw in and fill in the points of interest for one zone. I didn't even get 50% of the way through it. And I was like, I don't have the attention span for this. I'm just going to keep using my paper maps because I already had those printed out. They literally were like, here you go, you know, to draw it. And later on, they started including these really... My weapon rustic, you know, all, all three dimensions of a zone like, but are it's visible functional. at the same time maps. They, they start including these. And then the guy that was running EQ Atlas was like, all right, guys, I'm going to stop updating. I think we're we're getting replaced at this point. It's just, just this is a service that's no longer needed. And he, he shut down the site soon after. But as he mentioned, he was going to download a map pack. So apparently uh, there's still um, like an add-on that you can download to make the maps better. At least. And don't worry, I'll be downloading a new map pack and improving this later. Give my weapon to this NPC to improve it and get sent on more fetch quests. Now, these tutorial quests all reward armor and they are worth doing, like this one, find a mushroom. Now, in modern MMOs, any important items in the world would have a nameplate, or a highlight, or a graphical flourish, or be bigger and easier to spot, but not in EverQuest. When it says find a mushroom, it means find a mushroom-sized mushroom. As a reward, we get blessed. Passive effects on you are shown in this window here. If you left-click a beneficial effect, you will remove it, but if you hold right-click, a little expo- Yeah, if you click it, you just delete it. And I've tried to do that in other games because there's, there's, I mean, there's some games where I think, uh, I think in WoW, if you right click on a buff, you'll, you'll get it off of you because um, you can cancel your buffs, but not in every game you, that you can. Station window will pop up, but then it will disappear. So you must hold right click, wait for the window to pop up, cursor over the window while still holding right click, then release right click. This is the only way to make any window permanent. And this is important to know because there are so many windows. Honestly, EverQuest is a game of window management. There's more windows here than an orgy at Microsoft. They are all important, all <laughs> movable, and all resizable. And ultimately, a lot of screen real estate will be taken up by windows. There's no slimline or minimalist UI here. You will see everything, almost all the time. And on higher res monitors, this can mean really leaning in to read the very small text. But this uh... contrasts quite strongly with another design choice, mainly the choice to not tell you important numerical things. A load of windows clearly means the game wants you to have total control and knowledge over your character's status at all times, down to the minutia of the game. But despite giving you access to a load of information, it doesn't actually give you specifics. Let's say you examine the effect text of this buff spell, Grim Aura. It says, increases your attack for 27 minutes. Okay, how much does it increase by? Is it a static number or a percent of my own stats? Is it damage or accuracy? Does it improve my... Yeah, we, um... Guild Wars 2 players are familiar with the wiki command. We would basically wiki stuff in EverQuest a lot. Uh, there was a website, I don't know if it's still up, called Alak Hazam. It was Alak Hazam, but it was spelled all, all in a weird way. Uh, but Alak Hazam was a website that is kind of like the uh, Wowhead or uh, the GW2 wiki is today. And we that was like our center for information for this kind of stuff back in the day. Attacks penetration against enemies resistance or armor. You will not know because in EverQuest, many things don't tell you the numerical values of what they do. It will just say you do something better, but you have no idea how much better. Like scream of hate lowers the enemy's attack while raising yours. By how much does it do either of these things? Don't know, doesn't say. You'll only know you're buffed. Now the game is clearly tracking these numbers behind the scenes, but you don't need to know them. Like how you cannot change the enemy's hit point display to be a specific number of hit points. It is always a percent of hit points above their head. You can see the numbers in the combat box of how much you're doing and how much they're doing, but never above their heads. So to cast buff spells, we must know spells. We get given a spell scroll. Now to learn a spell, open your spell book, scribe the scroll from your inventory to your book, and then when it's in the book, drag a known spell from your book to your spell gem bar. Then when it's on your spell gem bar, move it from your gem bar to your hot bar linked to a keybind. And this may seem like an obtuse number of steps. 
Okay. And that's because it is. This to, to pause right there, because he, when he spits it all out like that, every, every word he said was true, but that does make it sound more complicated than it actually is. Um, so scribing spells. When you would buy a spell and scribe it into your book, that was one time ever. You only ever had to do that one time per spell. When you scribed it, it was in your spell book forever. Now, the gems thing, this thing down here, you could have eight spells memorized and ready to go. If any of you play Dungeons and Dragons, it's like a wizard. The wizard could have so many spells in the book, but he could only have so many locked and loaded and ready to fire at a time. So just imagine that your spell book, at max level, you might have 100 spells in there, but you could have eight memorized on your hot bar ready to go. Now, he put them on the gems and then he dragged them from the gems down to the hot bar. Uh, if memory serves, you can just hotkey the gems. You don't have to take them from the gems to the hot bars. Like, I think I had like Alt 1 through Alt 8 or something was my gems, but then I also had just like one through whatever is that. Uh, so like, let's say that you were, you had buff spells, but maybe once per hour you needed to buff. You would sit down, put the buffs on the gems, use them, sit down, put your normal spells back on the gems, and then that's it for the next hour. Unless you died, in which case you would do that again. Uh, and then you could organize the stuff in the spell book. Because like, the stuff in the book, you could drag and drop it and move it. So you could organize however you want. So you might have a page with all your highest level buffs and a page with your best nukes, a page with your best dots, and then stuff that's out of date. Because uh, similar to like original wor uh, World of Warcraft, you would have many tiers of spells. You'd have like your level one ice nuke, your level four ice nuke, your level nine ice nuke, you know, and you don't need to have all of those. So the ones that were out of date, you just kind of push further back in the book. Uh, and deal with that another time. Does mean that you can have hundreds of spells known in your spell book, but only a few gems active at any time. These are the spells you can actually cast. But in a nice touch, you can right click on an empty slot on the spell gem bar or on your hot bars and open up a flowchart where you can move through exactly what style of spells you've got and find ones that you currently know. As a task, I get rewarded with a fast stick. Flowchart thing is new. That's cool. That wasn't there when I played. Stick, an item with an ability to use the stick, stick them onto a hot bar, target yourself, then cast the stick and gain the blessing of swiftness, increasing your movement speed by how much? Some, some movements. I think the blessing of swiftness was like 35% movement speed. Uh, but yeah, if you got any item that had um, charges of a spell, you could just put the item on a hotbar button and then just hit that button whenever you wanted to activate the spell, which is what he just did. Speed. Grab a load of quests by hailing all the local NPCs and then go and kill some rats. Now, combat is very much a slow turn-based system. Fun little thing. Uh, I, I mentioned to you guys about typing to the NPCs. You would walk up to them, hit H. They would say, oh, like, man, I hate bandits. You would hit enter to open a text box to type, man, I hate bandits too, F bandits. And then they would continue the conversation. Imagine any time you started typing without actually hitting enter first. The moment that you hit the letter A, your auto attack turned on. So you'd have someone try it so many times. Newbies would be trying to talk to guards and they'd hail them, start typing like muck bandits and it would be A and then they hit that A and they would like swing and miss at the guard and the guard would just one shot kill, one shot kill. I mean, there was always a couple of dead newbies around any important NPCs to talk to because they were max level so that people couldn't like uh, troll and uh, you know, get, take, get rid of them easily. Uh, and anytime you accidentally hit the A key while trying to type to them, uh, you, yeah, you got clapped. You got destroyed. Except you'll want to look at the combat side of the text box more than your character's animations because your attack speed doesn't always line up to the animations. And any damage you do or take is shown in the text box, not by damage numbers appearing in the game. Now during combat, if you can't see an enemy's total health before a fight, how do you know what's safe to attack and what isn't? Well, when you left click the color around them or right click on an NPC, you will consider it and you'll get a line of colored text in the main. You could also, if you left click, no, so the, the aura around the rat, that's like a white gray aura around it, that was added to the game later. Uh, it used to be you would click on an, en on an enemy and just hit C, which would do con a consider. And in your text box, there would either be uh, a red message that says you're going to die, or a yellow box would be like, this is going to be an uphill battle. Uh, white text would be like, looks like an even fight, which meant it was your level. Blue text would be like, you think you've got the advantage. Green text would be like, this would be easy. And gray would be like, you have nothing to learn from this opponent. Uh, so it was like red was way higher level than you, yellow was just above your level, white was even, blue was below your level. So like warriors were very bad at soloing just because they just basically had auto attack. So they would usually stick to blue and green targets, things where they had a level advantage of, but not gray because gray gave no XP, for example. Uh, but um, necromancers, as long as they could land, if it was fearable, it was farmable. 
A necromancer would just fear an enemy, throw dots on it, and throw their pet on it, and the thing would be running away screaming while getting hit in the back and dots ripping it apart. Uh, and so they, they didn't care if it was a yellow mob as long as they could land their spells. In box, bards were solo kings, bards too, yeah. Referencing the enemy's levels, and a little description based on the level difference to yours. They range from many levels below you, showing in green with looks like a reasonably safe opponent, to many levels above you in red, saying, what would you like your tombstone to say? Enemy that is a lot of text, but let's just say it was red, don't, yellow, don't unless you are really good at soloing, white, same level as you, blue, good for farming, green, barely any XP, grade none. Is your level often have black names and always describes as looks like quite a gamble, and it is. In EverQuest 1, enemies can do significant damage even on the same level as you. Two, three, or four enemies at the same time, without a solid plan, and you are dead. While fighting, or while doing anything actually, swimming, jumping, meditating, or using a trade skill, you'll be gaining experience and levels in minor skills within that major skill. Hit an enemy with a one-handed slashing weapon, you'll improve one-handed slashing. Successfully block, you'll improve blocking. But there's even a skill for overall offense. If you cast an enchantment spell, you'll not only gain skills in enchantment, but also specialized enchantment. What the yeah, so, like, any time that... Now, after you'd played for a while, all these skills would be maxed out for your level. Every time you leveled up, I believe the cap on all these skills increased by 5. So, like, when you were level 4, all your skills could level up to 20. Um, now, offense leveled up anytime you did anything with any weapon. Um, but then there was one-hand blunt was, like, clubs, hammers. Two-hand blunt was, like, sledgehammers, uh, staff. Uh, one-hand pierce was, like, daggers. Two-hand pierce was, like, spears. One hand slash was like swords and axes. Two hand slash was like two hand swords and axes. Uh, things like that. Um, so offense would almost always be caught up with your level. But if you were uh, level 30 and you've been using swords the whole time and you just got a really good war hammer and you swap to it, you would miss a lot because you had to level up your blunt skill because you were bad with hammers. What this does mean is, if you spend all your time fighting with a hammer, then you'll be really good with- Channeling was the ability to cast spells while something was punching you in the face. It was basically the ability to just keep going with the cast and ignore the fact that you just got hit. The hammer. If you then find a better sword, you may not be better no. with it. Because this is literally okay. I just talked about. She won't hit as frequently or as hard because your sword skill is lower. What this means is, and this is most commonly seen in spells, you need to use something low level and basic to train up your minor skill in that thing before you equip yourself with something higher level and more exotic. Because if you find, I don't know if it changed. I'm just speaking from my own experience here. Um, the level of the weapon didn't matter for like the training. What it mattered was. Um, the attack speed, so the faster you swung, the more attempts you would do, and the defense of the thing you're hitting. Because, like, if an enemy was level 4, their max defense was 20, because you get 5 per level. If they were level 20, their max defense was 100. So, you know, just find an enemy that was... It had to be green or higher, because it couldn't be gray, and get the fastest attacking weapon of whatever type you're trying to level, and just go ham on it. Uh, if you, if possible, get an enchanter or a shaman to put an attack speed buff on you and just swing and miss a thousand times to get your skill to basically power level as fast as you can. Find a really high level weapon that you aren't skilled with and try and use it, you will constantly miss. And because you only gain experience for successful hits, you will not gain experience fast enough to be efficient with that weapon. It's the same with spells. If you attempt to cast a spell and fail, the spell will fizzle. And your fizzle chance on extremely high level spells that you are not skilled with is almost 100%. So if I have a summon really powerful weapon spell, I will keep fizzling with it until I have gone back, purchased the summon very weak weapon spell, and used that hundreds of times to get better at that specific school of magic where the high level spells stop fizzling. I open the menus and rebind time. Right, so if you have not... There's different schools of magic. Conjuration, abjuration, evocation, uh, unite all peoples within our nation, all that stuff. So if you were trying... If you hadn't used a, a really common one that people would never get around to using was illusion until they got invisibility. If you were playing a pure caster and you get to the point where you get invis and you try to cast it and it would just fail because the low-level illusion spells were not great. There was one called Flash of Light that would blind an enemy for a minute that was really funny in PvP. It literally turned your monitor black. You had their text box and that's it. Your monitor was basically off. That was Flash of Light. Okay, it was worse than a Counter-Strike flashbang. Uh, hilarious in PvP doesn't really affect NPCs that much. So it wasn't a big deal to use these. So when you would unlock, uh, like, uh, your mage, you unlock and visit level 30, it was time to get the low-level flash of light out and just spam it on mobs a bunch of time when it's not necessary to get your illusion up until you can cast invis 
without having the spell fail 40 times and you burning half your mana pool. Target nearest enemy NPC to tab as God intended. Can you show us flash of light? Yeah, it looks like, the, oh no, sorry, hold on, sorry. YouTube would be fine with it, Twitch won't. And then have a nice sit down, and this is something you'll be doing a lot in EverQuest. After a fight, you'll likely be missing some hit points, or if you're a caster, some mana. While standing there, these refill incredibly slowly, but while sitting, they refill incredibly slowly, but a little bit faster. Sitting. Okay, so from what I remember, every six seconds was like a tick. They, cut, they, they measured things in ticks in the game. Like, uh, three ticks was 18 seconds. So every tick, I think most races got back one hit point. But if they're sitting, oh baby, you got back two. Unless you were a troll or an Ixar. The Ixar were the lizard people. They had regeneration. They got two hit points standing and four sitting. Which was actually huge. Because, you know, th that adds up. That that all going all the time. Like, I'm regenerating two health per tick and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Like, that added up. That was great. Uh, like, if you were leveling a character and you were one of those races, mm. the original Muckluck, my namesake, uh, was a troll shaman I made. And uh, the regeneration was great. Also, they had Infravision. Uh, when it was uh, really dark, they could still see uh, everything in red. Uh, all enemies were uh, in glowing red. It was like they had uh, infrared vision. In between fights is a staple of this game, and it used to be because players would team up and the recovery between battles was social time, chat, trade. They say EverQuest is the world's prettiest chat room, it's just a social hangout with an RPG attached to play between talking, and there is some truth to this. Now, older MMORPGs had a lot in common with chat rooms, because back when they were released, talking with someone over the internet in real time was still a novel thing to do. You'd slap a game alongside that and you've got a community going. The game was never the focus, the interaction was. But now, with communication moving off the game to places like Discord. WhatsApp or Discord, the downtime in the game is no longer needed to talk to other people, but it is still there, which Yeah, so at the time I was playing this with people, I only communicated with those people in the game or on the forums. We didn't have Discord. I don't even think we had Ventrilo or TeamSpeak yet. Uh, that was later on at the time that I played it. So really, these people, I would communicate, I would log in to chat with friends. Like, I didn't get to talk to them outside of that. Means if you're playing alone, you'll be sat doing nothing a lot. Combine this with the fact that the majority of live servers contain almost all of the player base at the end game, and as a new player on a live server, you will be adventuring through Norath alone for the vast majority of your gameplay experience, unless you specifically bring your own friends with you. Kill some rats and some bats and do some more local quests, and you'll notice your map is annotated with certain things, but not marked with enemy spawn locations, so quest mobs do take some time to find. I discover some items are not tradable, and while casting a spell or activating an ability, you get this little cast timer. If you're hit during it, you'll be interrupted, so casting in melee combat is a risk. However, the act of casting anything also improves- I just noticed this character, Josh Strife Mage. Moves your channeling skill, and with a high enough channeling skill, you can tank some hits and not be interrupted. And now a movement issue. W is forward, S is backward, A and D is turn, unless you hold right click where A and D becomes strafe. But you cannot run forward and strafe and turn all at the same time, meaning you can't run diagonal while swinging the camera. Running, running sideways, running diagonal, running forward while turning the camera, but not all at the same time. I need to find a flower for a quest, and the map has no hints to where it may be, and then I'm injured, so I need to use a bandage, which means knowing the trade skill bind wound, then assigning that trade skill to a hotkey, then targeting whoever I'm healing, in this case myself, then activating bind wound with the hotkey, then waiting while I get better at the skill. That is a lot of focused steps, and this is something EverQuest is. So, uh, on that topic, um... Bind wound, it's first aid, okay? The way that it worked in the game, first, yeah, you had to make a button for it on your bar. That was a one-time thing. Once you have the button, you have the button. That's it. Um, and basically, uh, if you were low health, you would target yourself. Uh, F1 targeted yourself, or you could click on an ally and try to bind them, and you'd be like, hold still, and your character would kneel down and do like a bandage animation, and it would either fail or succeed. If it succeeded, uh, well, sorry, either way, it would consume one bandage from your inventory. So you needed to be carrying those. And it, if it succeeded, it would heal an ally. But it could only be used on people below 50% health. Like, a, you know, they actually had to be wounded to bind a wound. So a warrior that was soloing loved to make friends with a mage. Because a mage, here's the difference between a mage and a wizard in the world of Norath chat. Wizard, boom. Big damage blast. That's it it a mage slightly smaller boom and you know the whole concept of pulling a rabbit out of a hat the mage could make something out of nothing including sets of armor that last until the person with it logs out food water pets earth air fire and air elementals uh and bandages they could literally use their mana to summon stacks of bandages and just give 80 bandages to a warrior and he's got those until he logs out. 
Uh, everything that was given to you by a mage would disappear when they, when you logged out if it was uh, summoned by the mage. Uh, but they were masters of conjuration. Very, very cool class. Detailed. Playing EverQuest as a new player feels like learning to fly a plane or operate an old proprietary computer operating system, and you're just handed a massive manual and wished good luck. There's a lot you can do. It's overwhelming, and learning it isn't easy. But once you get the hang of it, after however many hours, or in this case days it takes, you do feel in control. As Reddit puts it, EverQuest is a slow game, and this is one of the great ironies of its modern state. Everyone tells me when you play an old MMORPG, don't rush to endgame. Play it slowly, enjoy the journey. And okay, but if you do that in EverQuest, you're enjoying an extremely long, extremely slow, often very lonely journey unless you're playing with friends you've brought along at your own level because the majority of a community on a live server are either at the end game or have moved to progression servers live regular servers don't have the mass of players either in the early or mid game needed to make enjoying the journey as magical as it was there's no denying everquest is hugely influential in the genre it built a lot of the foundations and systems other games would go on to refine but over time what we as players expect becomes harder to achieve we are harder to impress something that was once considered groundbreaking when you return to it is just a big pile of broken ground. Playing EverQuest without ne Short story about this. The first time I played EverQuest, I had just come from playing Half-Life 1 and I think Diablo 2. And I was playing EverQuest for my first time. And I remember I saw in the low level zone, the newbie zone, there was an Ever there was a skeleton and he had like a staff. And he was trying to beat me to death with the staff. And I killed the skeleton and he dropped the staff. And that blew my mind. That sounds so silly. But up until that point, there was no en no game I had played where I saw enemy with weapon. I kill him. That weapon could be looted. You know, and again, I had just been playing Diablo 2 and Half-Life. There was no game up until that point I had played where that was a thing. I was shocked by that. Like, I killed a bat. I could loot bat wings. I killed a skeleton. I could loot bone chips. I, I killed a skeleton with a scimitar. I could take the scimitar. Like, you could look at a raid boss... And raid bosses had a whole slew of different weapons. And if it was a humanoid, he might be wielding one of them. And you could be like, guys, he's got the warrior sword this week. And that would hardly change the fight. But the warriors were getting hyped. They were already in their head planning to roll. They did Because you could tell he had that loot this week because he was beating you to death with it. And it, it was a cool thing. At the time, that was new. That was novel. Not anymore. But back then... That was exciting. Nostalgia is like listening to Elvis Presley. People will tell you how incredibly rebellious and groundbreaking Elvis was at the time. How Elvis mania swept the nation, even the famous line, Elvis has left the building, caused mass excitement. But if you get someone not connected to any of that to listen to Elvis today, and the hype just isn't there, the social excitement, the atmosphere that made it all, if you've only got the music, it's good, but it's not the same experience. When you remove the product, from the context which enhanced the product, you don't get the same impact. Shaking hips and crooning on stage used to be unacceptably sexy, but it paved the way for the media we know today. Now, we're so far ahead of the paved Now you have to grow a beard and wear a vest to be sexy. What the heck? Half, it looks quaint by comparison. New players cannot play through your memories, and playing EverQuest today is like listening to Elvis with no background information. Yeah, you can see the quality and understand that when it was new, it would have been amazing, but it's not the rebellious novel or exciting thing it used to be. And when hardcore enfranchised fans get annoyed at you for not enjoying it like that, Oh, he's on a necro now. Oh. They did. You might need to remind those fans it's much easier to enjoy something when the entire situation around it was intensely enjoyable. But now we've got the product without the situation. Back to the game. Tactical note, if you aggro an enemy mob, they will not stop chasing you across the whole map. But guard NPCs can kill them very fast. Doesn't give you experience, but does save you. Ah, my first kill 20 qu- Yeah. Um, trying to remember... In EverQuest, I, I think if an NPC got the last hit... There was no, like, it didn't leave a corpse. Um, but there might have been a rule if you did more than 50% of the damage. Like, if players did more than 50% of the damage, they could get the kill. Um, but I remember one time, I don't remember how they did it, but there was a priest of Discord. And it was a guy you could talk to in every major city in order to uh, get PvP flagged. If you wanted to do PvP on a non-PvP server. And I remember someone somehow, I don't know if they did it with like mind control because enchanters could, could charm things. They managed to get the guards of the city and the priest of discord in a fight against each other. And the priest took out like 20 of the guards, but then the remaining ones managed to kill him. And the players, which of course this was by uh, the Wood Elf city of Kelethon. This is a low level area. All the low level players like, if we can get the last hit, we can get his loot. And you know, we were running in and we would try to get just like the final swing. And even when he was at 1%, he was like, poof, and he'd kill like nine newbies. 
<laughs> like we didn't stand a chance. Like it, it was like that scene at the beginning of Lord of the Rings when Sauron swings his mace and just like sends twenty dudes flying into a new county, and they have get to get a new uh, zip code. Like it was it was that. West, and so the grind begins. I'm also told to press V to open the alternative advancement window. This lets you spend specific skill points on things, but only applies to characters level 51 and above, so you as a new player will not need this. When you do hit level 5, though, you get some in-game mail and told about the origin skill, which appears in the alternate advancement list, but is the only one you can take for free. It is a recall to Crescent's Reach. You can cast it for free once every 20 minutes. And a goblin finally dropped a shield, and now I am resting after every fight. And now a good system for solo players, mercenaries, or mercs. You can hire an NPC helper. They're free up to level 15, and then have a very small gold cost. So I I know uh, from my dabbling in EverQuest years and years later after I played it like, during its prime time, um, I know that they added the mercenaries, but that was sometime in between expansion 7 and 29. I don't know exactly when they added mercenaries, but if you played Guild Wars 1, it's like that mercenary system sort of every 15 minutes, which is essentially a gold sink for the game. It's automatically paid, and if you're playing even semi-competently, you won't notice it. As I'm a melee tank, I think, you know what, I'll go for a healer mercenary. Everyone, meet Serana. But then it seems I bought a mercenary without accepting the buy mercenary quest, so I didn't count. So I dismiss Serana and buy another to finish the quest, so everyone, meet Brown Nana. Mercs are great. They're incredibly tough, great at healing, and do decent damage. It's like you have a competent player alongside you at all times covering your weakest aspect. They do, however, struggle with bridges and have a tendency to aggro enemies you're trying to avoid, so in fact they are exactly like other players. Thank you, my spells <laughs> seem to have pretty decent range so I can grab the aggro from distant enemies. These spiders have some pretty decent modern graphics, and you can definitely tell when they've gone round and updated the enemy models. They look downright Yeah, that is not how spiders looked when I last played the game. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Um, EQ Terror Anchula. It's got the, the usual model. Let's see, images. Okay, all right, see this, where it's got like <laughs> just a few pixels for the spot. That's how it looked when I last played the game. So it's definitely gotten a bit better. Good. Now this quest needs me to open a chest, but at the time I didn't know you really, could- The only thing scary about Terror Angel is it was the size of a skyscraper and it would sneak up on you. Target a container and type slash open. So instead, I just attacked it until it broke. And while doing this, another player, this frog necromancer called Ghoul Hopper, asks me, why are you hitting the chest? So we chat for a while, and then he hops off on his way. It's interesting to see that I'm not the only new player, but little did I know, the saga of Ghoul Hopper would become much deeper and much darker. Which <laughs> I have such a hateful relationship with the frog I'm not locks. the only new player. These are frog locks, and they're actually loved by the paladin god. And like they they are frogs of justice, chat. They uh, they they are prime paladins. Uh, they had an event in the game. I played a troll. Trolls lived in this gutter city called Grob, and they did an event in the game where the frog locks rose up and attacked Grob. And just so you know, the trolls didn't like enslave frogs or anything. They just hated each other. <laughs> so the frogs rose up and attacked Grob. And literally, if you were logged in, you could try to defend the city, but it got like more and more and larger waves until eventually all the players defending the city buckled and the city fell. It was a real in-game event. And then the next day, it was, I believe, called Gukta or something like that. They they literally stole the city. And from that day forward, if you made a troll character, you started in the dark elf ghetto. <laughs> you were mooching off the dark elves in the city of Nariak. But if you made a frog lock, you got to make the character in Gukta, which was the city they stole from the trolls. Dude, people literally were selling shirts that had the date. It was like, you know, like 111, never forget. <laughs> it's like the day Grob fell. Yeah, but little did I know, the saga of Ghoul Hopper would become much deeper and much darker. Reach level six and get an exciting new mechanic, experience loss on death. Exact numbers are iffy, but people seem to agree dying loses you between eight and 10% of your gained experience yeah. to the next level. For a game- So, one interesting thing about EQ, there were no trash players at max level. There, there were some that weren't great. The trash ones couldn't reach max level. <laughs> the game acted as its own filter. If you died a lot, you kept de-leveling, chat you would lose 10% of your current level's experience. So if you were almost to level 40, and then you died 10 times, you go like back down to 38. I'm focused on enjoying the journey, they should- Now, if, a, if you hired a cleric to revive you, you would get back, or like resurrect you, you would get back um, experience based on the level of the cleric. But if you did a corpse run and just looted your whole body and didn't, uh, if you looted every last item, okay, I, I gotta explain corpse running. If you died, you'd reappear naked. 
you'd run back to your body and have to loot your own body and be like, all right, earring, earring, helmet, armor. Put on your gear. And you could just like right click it and it would shoot over. But you would have to reloot your whole body. Now, when you pulled the last item off your body, it vanished. It would despawn to save server space. So what you would do is leave one trashy piece of thing on the body and then drag your now naked body around. Cleric! Hiring a cleric! Because if you could find a cleric to revive your old naked self, you would get back a bunch of that XP you lost. But if you couldn't find one, then that was it. That was it. Or do make the journey tedious. Sell some stuff to a merchant one item at a time, buy a new damage over time spell, then just work through the quest. And the slow progression does bring benefits. Winning a fight against two or more enemies feels amazing, like a genuine achievement. Does it feel amazing enough to justify being in the tutorial for three or four hours? No. While doing this, I chat to Google <laughs> some more and make my first ever quest friend. Oh, when you pick up a new item, hold right click on it for the info box. Red item names means you can't use them. Green means you can. The friend list. Uh, in that game, you could uh, be like slash friend space add space character name. The funny thing was, is that it was the only way to really keep an eye on if your friends were online or not, or people you hated. So you would sometimes put people that you wanted to keep an eye out for that you despised on your friend list, just so you could kind of monitor their location. I remember one time I was explaining to my dad, I was like, yeah, I freaking hate this guy. So I put him on my friends list. And he's like, what? He's like, what are you doing? And if you click the little drop down menu, you can compare it against what you've got equipped currently, which is great. Hey, remember the damaging disease cloud spell that ticks damage for like seven minutes? Don't cast it on yourself because you will just poison yourself. EverQuest really yeah, um, the game does not stop you from casting beneficial spells on enemies or negative spells on yourself. If you accidentally hit F1 and target yourself, even if you're facing an enemy, I remember a friend of mine who was playing the game one day and he was charging up a fireball, <laughs> blew his own head off, knocked himself the muck out. He was still in the newbie zone chat. He was level four, blasted his own face off. And there was other times where you'd see someone like, well, why can't we kill this guy? And goes and start screaming, because the healer's healing him. <laughs> yeah, the healer would accidentally have the enemy targeted and be pumping heals into the enemy. Like it let you do that. Uh, one specific time I remember is that there was a, uh, a dot that shamans had that came from their epic weapon called the Spear of Fate. Not important, but they had a dot, damage over time, and it worked, they, it had a mechanic that the community called Splurt, because there was a spell called Splurt that did this. It would do one damage, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, and it would keep doubling until it had done about a thousand. So the beginning of the dot did almost nothing, the end of it was a huge hit on the, the HP bar. So you did not want to recast it till it had done the full effect. It was unnoticeable damage for the first like 30 seconds it was on the enemy. Um, they accidentally one day flipped it in the code and made it change from a damage splurt to a heal splurt. And so you would cast it on an enemy and be fighting the enemy, fighting the enemy, and then the enemy, enemy would be like, what, what? and just shoot to full health. You're like, what is going on? Well, when Pete, when the community realized what happens, shamans were like, oh my God, my spear now fires healing splurts. And so they'd be fighting the enemy, stab themselves with their own spear, fight enemy, fight enemy, stab self with own spear, and we were getting infinite heals. Until a week later, they patched it back to normal and didn't tell us. And all of us shamans mucking killed ourselves. <laughs> That is a true story. We didn't know they fixed it. And in the next battle we did, we're like, free splurt. Oh, oh God. Oh, and they just explode a minute later. We had no idea. They didn't tell us. So I was like, thanks, Sony. Appreciate that. But yeah, the game did not stop you from doing negative things to yourself or positive things to them. Really is like learning to drive a really complex vehicle, complete with being allowed to crash it if you make the wrong choice. Finally get my skelly boy summon spell, descend into the mines and find this big chunky boy. I'll avoid you for now. Kill a load of captains <laughs> and honestly I'm getting a bit fed up with the combat music. It is a 30 second loop, incredibly intense, then it dies and then restarts. Constantly. It sounds like this. It's the same music from 20 years ago. Take on a mini boss with Ghoul Hopper's assistance, and nothing is instanced. Quest items, enemies, mini bosses, everything is public open world. So if someone finds the item you need or kills the mob you want, you will have to wait for it to respawn. And so Ghoul Hopper's mercenary is a skeleton, not his pet, his mercenary. You can hire skeleton mercs? 
Some of the respawns That's can take new. a while. This also means there are no dungeons in effect. There are just large open maps with bosses at the end that anyone can fight through and then camp the final boss. Storm the fort deep into the mine, take down the boss alongside Ghoulhopper again, finish every quest in the mine, get all the beginner armor, and then get sent to Crescent's Reach to begin my adventure in Norath proper. And now if- The bards bring different music. No, the bards had songs that were basically spells, uh, and but they, they it didn't play like actual music out of your speakers. Uh, bards are very interesting. So imagine like- Imagine that, like, if they're playing a song, like, every one second, they would apply a three-second buff to you. So if they hit one, it turns song on, one again turns song off. So they had a thing called the community called twisting. If they hit one, one, two, two, three, three, 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 a couple things would happen. One, you'd have the buffs from three different songs on you at the same time. The second thing that would happen is that bard would get carpal tunnel and he would hate you find one of the best systems that EverQuest has for guiding new players, the Hero's Journey Suggestion Path. Click the EverQuest button, then Quests, then Hero's Journey, and it will list all the recommended stuff for your level in the current area. And if this is new, I don't remember this. If you outlevel the area, it suggests the next area to go to. For a new player, this is great, because EverQuest treads that fine line between having an established narrative plot and just letting you explore around, and this gives you suggestions for where to go without demanding you do it. Run around this big grove, find these six arrogant dragons just sitting around doing nothing, and then head down to the guild hall and, oh god, I'm over in the furry corner. Corner. I'm given a letter to take to Mistra in Crescent's Reach, and thankfully everything is signposted quite well. We're sent off to do some spider killing and mushroom foraging, and then I go for a nice swim. Interestingly, your ability to swim is based on how much weight you're carrying in total. More, and you will sink faster. And with limited breath, you can indeed drown. Crescent. Let's talk weight. When you loot coins in Guild Wars 2, my game of choice, every time I loot 100 copper, it turns into a silver. Every time I loot 100 silver, it turns into a gold. The end. Imagine if it didn't. In EverQuest, when you loot coppers and silvers, they don't automatically turn into silvers and gold. They stay coppers or silvers until you visit a bank. Coins have weight. Coins have weight. So if you are super over encumbered, throwing your coppers on the ground would be one of the first things you get rid of. A funny prank to play on a friend, if there was someone you knew, if you owed them money, is to be like, hey, meet me here and be like at the top of a staircase. And they meet you there, and you're like, here's the money I give you. And instead of giving him six platinum, give him 6,000 copper. And he'll be like, you mother... And then he can barely move. Now, a side effect of having all that weight is the distance required for you to fall before fall damage kicks in is reduced the more over-encumbered you are. Until the point that stepping down down a staircase step would kill you. <laughs> if you could get a friend to meet you at the top of a staircase and give him the money you owe him in coppers, he would die descending the stairs. He would just straight up die. Reach itself is a grand, well-defended mountainside city. I discover those spider and mushroom quests were repeatable, so if I need to grind some experience, I'll just do them again. Then I grab a lift to the upper levels, and the lifts are activated with these little buttons, although nothing tells you this. I just clicked around randomly. And alongside the hero- I remember learning that the hard way. Kelethon, um, City of the Wood Elves is a city in the treetops. Lots of people fall to their death off Kelethon. There's no guardrails. Uh, they have elevators. They're wood elves with elevators, but they've got little buttons that have no indicators that they're buttons, but you had to figure out or watch other people do it. Hey, you know, it's typing in chat. How did you get the elevator to work? And they're like, oh, you click on that thing right there. Oh, okay. Rose Journey suggestion, you've got the Achievement Guidebook, a list of stuff you can do to earn achievement points. I don't know what these points do, but basically this, this breaks down new. everything you can do in any expansion in the game. So if you're unsure of what to do, wherever you are, open the achievements, pick something, work toward it. Great little direction giver. So Crescent's Reach is three floors, the ground floor of shops and library, the first floor of trade skills and vendors, and the top floor which is abandoned and full of massive skeletons. Now Jinkin has a load of quests for us, and the UI is beginning to get a bit busy. I look up some leveling guides to try and power level a bit, and it seems they're all based on which expansion you want to level through, or which expansion the current progression server is on or where you are in the world. But the most repeated live service advice is follow the hero's journey or the achievement lists. Grinding mobs is more efficient, yes, but doing quests helps you memorize the world and it's quite well paced. I need to pick up this pelt, this item, but it's too big to fit in this small bag. So you've got a main inventory and then smaller bag. Right. Okay. So right here, you notice he's got 10 big slots. Very large objects can go in those slots. Any, any object can go in those slots, but you can put a bag in those slots. You cannot put a bag in a bag. So you can have like a, a big bag in these or just put items there. Um, but if you get a really big quest item, sometimes it has to go in one of these slots. Also, 
Items that you put here can have an effect on the world around you. Uh, there was a very common item called, uh, uh, commonly used item called a light stone or a greater light stone. It does what it sounds like. It gives off light around you, helps you see in dark areas. If you put it in a slot that was not in a bag, that light would be produced around you. It didn't have to be equipped anywhere on your character or in your hand. It could just be in one of those slots that wasn't in a bag. So what he's talking about is he needs to put something here in a bag and then take that thing and put it in a, a bit, the big slot. You can put within your inventory and open up to give you more spaces. And despite items only ever taking up one inventory slot. Random fun fact, monks did more damage the less weight they were carrying. Monks made great teammates because they passed on all the loot. It slowed down their martial arts. Some items are considered too big to fit within smaller bags, meaning lots of rearranging and putting the biggest items in your main inventory and smaller stuff in the extra bags. I reach level 10 and get told about the Plane of Knowledge and how there's a weapon and armor quest waiting for me there. So the Plane of Knowledge is a hub zone introduced in the fourth Planes expansion, of Planes of Power, considered by many to be one of the better early expansions. You'll find many booked pedestals around many maps which teleport you to the Plane of Knowledge, and then you can teleport from the Plane of Knowledge to basically anywhere. We'll see a lot of this place later. So how do we get there if we Yeah, don't... basically every major city had a teleport to Plane of Knowledge, so you could use Plane of knowledge to travel to different places around the world and shave a lot of time off your traveling know where that book is. Well, another feature I love. Open the map and then click Zone Guide. This is a breakdown of every zone in the game. If you find where you want to go, click Add as End and then Find Path with where you are selected as the start. The game will then show you all of the map connections or NPC travel connections you'll need to make to end up in any specific zone, and that's a wonderful in-game navigation system. It doesn't always work if you've got to take too many NPC connections, but it's a damn sight better than having to Wikipedia everything. For now, we leave Crescent's Reach and enter the connected That walls. is awesome. Um, so again, that, that system is new to me, but that's cool. Welcome to Scotland, basically. There's fog, long sight lines of nothing, and a genuine sense of unease and foreboding. We'll be back here later a lot, but for now, run through the fog to reach the Plane of Knowledge teleport book and get magicked away to the main city. Oh, well, they updated how the books look. Is there a trainer here who good. offers to send you back? Oh god, I just remembered something. Okay, I had a friend once. He was, uh, I got him into EverQuest in high school. We were both playing it, and he had not, he didn't have enough money to buy Planes of Power, the, the newest expansion at that time, which had the Plane of Knowledge. So the Planes of Power were, th th like, they were the planes. You could literally go punch a god in the face there. The, the raids had gods as the final bosses. They were meant for the top echelon of people. Echelon? Echelon. The top people. But the Plane of Knowledge was useful for everyone of all levels because of that hub thing where, where it had a teleporter in every single city. My friend, on like his level 8 character, he'd been playing the game like, I don't know, 10 hours or something. He clicked on the Tome of Knowledge following me one day, and we didn't even think about it. He pours his character into the Plane of Knowledge, and then the game kicks him out because he hasn't bought it. After wrestling with trying to find some way to get his character out of there because he couldn't log into that character, he finally had to give up and make a new character. <laughs> Because he didn't, and we were high school. He didn't have the money to buy planes of knowledge, and he was so upset. He didn't have the money to buy planes of power, and he was so upset. But he had to, uh, he had to basically make a new character because he lost that one because he couldn't get to it uh, because he he threw it into an area that he couldn't log into because he didn't own it to Glooming Deep Mines if you've not finished it. I use the NPC Finder tool and search for Weapons Quest. Follow the path, hail them, and then get told I will not work with you. So racial tension in EverQuest is alive and well. Certain races hate others. They won't talk to them. Yes. Um, ogres, trolls, and dark elves will tolerate each other. Ixars hate everyone. That's the lizard people. And then everyone else is on the, their own side. The good guys. You know, you've got the humans, the high elves, the wood elves, um, the... Gnomes, the dwarves, uh, the, all, the, the alliance, you know, all of them are together. Um, so he's playing, it looks like a wood elf, and he's trying to talk to a dark elf, and the guy's saying, go muck yourself. Now, you can do quests to raise reputation with them. I was one of the only trolls in the uh, the wood elf area, and people were always shocked to see me there, because my character was like seven feet tall, and wood elves were like three foot four. Uh, but it, you know, it, it feels cool, because you're really like the center of attention. But you could grind out reputations with people that hated you and try to get to the point where they'll uh, they'll talk to you. Them. And unfortunately, being an edgy emo dragon boy, most people do not like me. That's why I'm forced to hang out with the furries and the scalies. The armor quest from here sends me to the Butcher Block Mountains. The in-game routing finds this map no problem at all, and we're sent to the east to kill some zombie dwarves, but notice that we don't have a map now. Turns out not all zones in EverQuest are mapped. They were sort of relying on the community to make physical act- Remember earlier when I mentioned you had to draw your own maps? I, I thought that was over. Maybe that's not over. 
Muck, do you have a uh, Dragon's Dogma YouTube playlist? If I do, it's on Mucklet Plays. Just uh, here, here's the link to Mucklet Plays. Just uh, search the playlist section. ...maps and share them around, and as old school and immersive as that sounds, not many modern players will want to do that when that just means having a map open on a second monitor. But never fear, because third-party apps are here to help, specifically the Braywall Map Pack, which means downloading the map pack, opening up your EverQuest map folder, making a new folder, moving some files around, and now when you open your map in-game, change the drop-down from default to Braywall, and boom, every zone in the game mapped. But not just that. NPCs labeled, quest mobs shown, ground spawn items highlighted, everything is labeled, and you can even search for things by keywords and then draw paths to them. Seriously, thank you, Braywall, this is fantastic. We're told go to a giant chessboard to the east, and without Braywall's maps, I'd never find this because east is actually looping back all the way around south. And you'll notice it's moving from day to night in the game. EverQuest has a day-night cycle, and certain mobs, sometimes quest mobs, only spawn at certain times of the day, all of the night, and the full cycle is 72 minutes long. This means if you miss a quest mob that only spawns at night, you can sometimes be waiting for up to 45 minutes for it to appear again. Take on two enemies and feel like an absolute tank, realize I've got loads of travel ahead of me, so I just bind auto run to T. But then I discover when I press T, it not only runs, but links the tell command of the last person I was talking to. And and that's how I discovered that in EverQuest, you can bind multiple commands to a single key. It won't say, there's a clash, you can't do this, it'll just say, okay, everything happens at once. In most <laughs> MMOs, this would be a problem, but EverQuest seems to embrace this because it adds to the sheer complexity of the game. For example, you could bind target self to a macro, then cast heal to a macro, and then both those macros to the same button. Means whenever you press it, you target yourself and immediately cast heal. EverQuest very much has the training wheel Let me tell you guys about a young muckluck that made the stupidest macro ever. Um, that when, uh, my, my, my highest level character was a shaman, 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 and, uh, I would join raids and shamans had a couple of jobs. Uh, their first was they had a spell called Mallow and when it, it was an unresistible spell that lowered the enemy's resistances. Then they had another spell that was actually the lower level version of Mallow called like Melosi and Melosi was resistible, but it shredded their resistances more. So my job was to cast Mallow lower his resist, Melosi shred his resist, and then a spell called like Torpor's Insects. Torpor's Insects slowed their the, the target's attack speed by 70%, I believe. And it's been 20 years. But raid bosses were balanced around you having used every tool at your disposal, including that, which means the f and by the way, Torpor's Insects was highly resistible, very easy to resist. So I'd be like Mallow, Mallow C, and then, you know, slow, slow, slow until it landed. And meanwhile, the first 30 seconds of the fight is the tank and the healers sweating bullets trying to stay alive because the boss is hitting three times faster than what is balanced around until I can get land that spell. Now, I was very young and I uh, made a macro that did slash cast slowing spell, slash yell, target, percent T would say the target's name, is slowed. Again, it's a highly resistible spell, so I'd have to hit the key a lot. So I'm like, is slowed, is slowed, is slowed, is slowed, it's slow. Okay, I got him for real that time. I was just screaming at the holes. I thought this was a good idea. I, I was like, genius, absolute genius taken off. It's an in-depth machine with no manual. I need to kill four haunted dwarves around this tower and the respawn timer is taking its sweet time and after 20 minutes I can return to the Plane of Knowledge and get a new item barely better than the stuff random mobs were dropping in the moors. I try to find some more quest NPCs in the Plane of Knowledge by using the find feature but I get told I'm underleveled for almost all of their quests but you only find this out after going through their dialogue tree to where the quest would start. I decide to just follow the hero's journey advice, return to Crescent's Reach and get grinding, killing pumas, bears and gnolls and my god I need some more inventory space. Grind up to level 11, try to cast a spell on an enemy underwater and get told the water distorts your view so not only is there water physics, there's also water blocking. My skeleton has a punch-up with an alligator, and then I throw all my junk into the crescent re- I straight up do not remember the water distorts your your view thing. I literally remember people, like, shooting a shark, and the shark just flying onto land and fighting back. Like, there were, the sharks weren't confined to the water. <laughs> Each bank. Important they note, must banks have are universal, that. but the shared bank can be accessed by your other characters on the same server. While here, I decide to learn a trade skill. Baking. How hard can baking be? Well, this bit took me about 45 minutes. You need to- Do you guys remember we looked at trading earlier? They had the trade window and you'd put like up to four items in and maybe including coin, hit trade, and then you would get something back. Uh, the trade skills, as I remember, were the same thing. You'd have to find the items you would need. There's no recipe list. You'd find the items you need to put in, like dough, flour, eggs, uh, pie mold, and then you would get back what you needed. So let's see if it's changed. To make oatmeal, you're given some oats and some water. Okay, cool. I can do this. Right click, combine. 
No. Click and drag. No. Oh, of course. Right click the crafting stations within the room that I got given the quest. And this opens this kind of interface. And you can combine things together, but I don't know the recipe, so I click experiment. And then I combine water and oatmeal. And no, that doesn't work either. How do I do this? Okay, so you need to buy a mixing bowl from this guy, but the game won't tell you that. Then make sure the bowl is in your main inventory slot, not an extra bag slot, because a bowl is a container item within itself, which will open up when you right click on it. And then you click on experiment and put water and oats into the experimental slots. But if you're experimenting, you can only put one water and one oats in, not all of them. The game will let you put all of them in, but if you try and do anything, it will say no, only put one thing in at a time. Then you experiment and learn the recipe. And now you know the recipe, so you can open the container and combine more on the main screen. But you sometimes fail, and the quest needs you to make 20 oatmeal. You get given 20 dry oatmeal and 20 hot water, so exactly enough. But if you fail to make one, you cannot ask the quest giver for more raw materials if you have any oatmeal in your inventory at all. Because for some reason, the blue hyperlinks now don't lead back to the same conversation. You must give the oatmeal that you have to them before they will give you any extra. Don't know why. I would guess that he could have just destroyed the remaining oatmeal to get it to, uh, like, because I, I'm guessing the trigger was just that he had oatmeal in his bag. So giving it to them or selling it or destroying it probably would have all moved on to the next thing. But yeah, that's, yeah why you've made it that obtuse. And it doesn't seem that oatmeal heals me any faster. So I checked the forums and it turns out that carrying food and water on you doesn't do anything. At least not actively. You don't eat it or drink it. You just... I believe as long as you had food in your inventory, your character would automatically eat a food every 30 minutes and their health regen would continue. And water was... You'd automatically use a water every 30 minutes and then your mana regen would continue. So if you were a warrior and you didn't have a mana bar, you could just not drink water for four years. <laughs> <laughs> Note, I don't recommend that. Uh, let's see if it's changed. To have it on you and it's consumed every few hours, and if you don't have any, your health and mana regen is a lot slower. Oh, hey, Ghoul Hopper's back, and damn, he's level 19, fast leveling frog. I tell him to download the Bray War map pack, and this is how old school games were. You collectively struggled until someone helps you with random advice. But it was much easier to give random advice when there were thousands of people struggling, not two. Ah, you know the old MMO meme, go and collect 10 bear asses? Well, that is legitimately a quest here, and it is tedious. Now, I'm still playing the free version, which has to be commended for having so much content, but every now and again, you'll get a pop up advertising membership and it can happen in the middle of combat which can be quite distracting Ugh. if you're in a difficult fight especially when it pops up over your hot bar and this is the first quest i feel is just padding i have to kill five gnolls to find five ore drops but then five more gnolls to find five ore bits and they're the same item you just change the name just collect 10 ore it's the same thing but now our story takes a somewhat unusual turn while playing i've been checking the only good side to those is sometimes you could kill an ore and get an ore drop uh, an ore chunk and an ore bit both so sometimes you would kill less than 10 uh but not guaranteed. I think Ghoul Hopper. So we add each other on Discord. And then we discover we've met before, four years ago, on Final Fantasy XIV. We have no other servers in common, and Ghoul Hopper doesn't know that I make videos, and this was before I started making videos anyway. So what a random coincidence. MMORPG games feel massive, but sometimes we are reminded that the total global player base is still relatively small in gaming terms. I grab some items, the quest says I have them, but I cannot for the life of me find them in my... Seeing him swimming reminds me of a short tale. Uh, there was one time, I had a uh, an alt bard, low-level bard character, and he got a spell one day, a song, and as long as he was playing that song, uh, he would give everyone around him underwater breathing. And most songs, you could just sing them, which meant you could fight with weapons in your hands and be singing, and it would pulse out from you. But if you had an instrument in your hand, it was much more effective. And songs had schools like School of Magic, like a, one would be strings, or one would be percussion, or one would be brass. Uh, the underwater breathing song was brass. So I had my guy, he had a small brass horn, and he was in the water, and if you're moving in water and you're not just like auto swimming into a wall, you will level your swimming skill. And at the beginning, it's horrendous. A level one character that has like zero skill in swimming, you're moving at like 10% your normal speed. And so I got my character in the water, I had a brass instrument, and underwater, I was playing the underwater he uh, breathing song on the brass instrument. I made a contraption out of Legos that on my keyboard held down the forward button and the left button. And for the next eight hours, I was asleep in the fountain in town in a circle. Like I was just, my left fin was broken. Like I was finding Nemo and I was just going in a circle for eight hours. The people in town were very concerned about me. And when I came back the next morning chat, my singing skill, my brass instrument skill and my swimming were maxed. I was like, I am ready for the world after that. Oh my God. It was, bard leveling was great for a while after I got that done. Inventory. So I wonder if they've been sent to my bank. So I find another great system while I'm at the bank. At your bank, you can choose find item and it will list every single item you're carrying or have. That's new. I do not remember a find feature. 
stored and where it is, down to the exact slot. And this is how I learned that the mixing bowl, despite being a trade skill item, also functions as a container and stuff has been going into it. I take a quick peek into the third <laughs> yeah. floor of Crescent's Reach and I'm still yeah, very under here. We'll come back here later. But what I really need is a new weapon. And it seems weapon shops in the game don't have stats, which is But I'll bet the mixing bowl has more weight than just an empty bag. Range, so I ask around and write, the weapons sold in most of these in-game shops are just cosmetic overrides for other actual statted weapons. The weapons you want to get are from quest rewards or enemy drops. And while there is an in-game auction house and economy, because most players are on members-only progression servers, the economy of free servers is incredibly slow and very heavily weighted to just the high end. More quest in the plane of knowledge, I'm sent to the northern desert of Ro, and the in-game guide takes me to Ice Mountain, which is the wrong way. You actually need to go to Freeport, then run to the east and then do the desert. I guess navigation isn't always perfect. I settle in to punch some snakes and this desert is an absolute chore. I spend this time watching guides, reading up on player walkthroughs, and I've learned the following. Do not use a healing mercenary, use a tank mercenary. And almost all long-term players on live servers are at the end game and early game is only populated on progression servers and if you're playing live, you need to pay for a boost. Now that's an old spider model. We talked about the new ones earlier. These are the ones I recall. Also, unless your server is listed as true box, everyone kind of expects you to multi-box. So what is that? Well, multi-boxing is the art of using software to run multiple instances of EverQuest at once and control every character on the same computer. So you're basically a complete adventuring party by yourself. If you don't want to do this, if you just want to solo, you have to accept that the game is incredibly slow. EverQuest is designed so that every time you form a party, it is greater than the sum of it. Dude, I was getting nervous about those beetles walking toward him. Parts. A tank is super efficient when they are joined by a DPS and a healer. A healer can't kill anything unless they're being buffed by a bard. A bard will die unless they have a tank. When you have a group, it's great. When you don't, it's tedious. So I follow the advice. Grab a tank mercenary and on my way bump back into Ghoulhopper and he gives me a mace he's found. It's a better weapon, so this is good. Grab some new spells from my guildmaster and off we go. Now, remember how every aspect has a skill number? I the first time I ever saw multi-boxing um, was actually when I was uh, dabbling in World of Warcraft. Um, someone joined, uh, it was after the arena came out, so I think Burning Crusader or later. And I saw someone join the arena and it was like 5v5 and he had five shamans. And they all hit a button and they all dropped their totems. So it was just like, they all in unison went thunk four totems. So suddenly there were 20, 20 totems on the field. And it was like, uh, and then before we could even process, they all did, I believe it was a, there was a cooldown they had where their next spell would guaranteed crit. And they would all, they all did like uh, that. And then another cooldown that made one spell instant cast. So they all fired an instant cast chain lightning. So five shamans fired a guaranteed crit instant cast chain lightning at one of our dudes, which d he was gone and bounced to all of us. And then they all five targeted a different person. They all hit earth shock, which was another instant. And it was a five versus three very, very quickly. Uh, and then, <laughs> that was the first time I ever saw multi-boxing was World of Warcraft's arena. Uh, but, uh, in dabbling back into EverQuest over the years, it's become very common because there's lots of people that just love the game, but finding parties is so freaking hard now. So they're just like, you know, fine, you know, Thanos voice, I'll do it myself. And they just, they play the whole party. They just play it like it's, uh, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 instead of, you know, an MMO. They just control everyone. I am fizzling so much on my new spells, it's not even worth trying to use them. Ooh, nice new mechanic. This quest needs me to kill an actual NPC in town, which means waiting for the guards to leave so I can hitman them in peace. Nice little mechanic there. Quick note about the hero's journey window. It does not update live. So if you complete a task in it, you need to close it, then reopen it to have that task removed or replaced. Look at this group of players all adventuring together or a single player multiboxing. We will never know. Sometimes you'll finish a quest and need to return to an NPC to get a reward. Sometimes you'll finish one and just be given a reward wherever you are. And I don't know what the difference is between the two. Start this incredibly long quest of completing a fake for every member of the council and stupidly I accept all the quests without thoroughly reading them because I'm in a hurry and the quest journal does not give you a full recap. Thankfully, the Alakazam EverQuest wiki... It's still up. Oh, that's glorious. Alakazam. So this was named... I'm gonna, I'm gonna type this in chat. Uh, Alakazam. I'm pretty sure it's spelled like that. He was a wizard. He had a wizard in-game named that. Alakazam. And then he made this website, which is kind of like a wiki, and then it took off. And uh, it's cool to see that it's still up today has full text logs of everything, so I... You know what? Hey, hold on. Random story. Uh, let me see. Alakazam, Lord, Dolmajan, G-R-N, and Moranar. Uh, Moranar. Let me see if I spelled that right. Let me see if I sp spell this right. There we go. All right. So, uh, really quick story. This is, uh, this is, uh, Alakazam. This boss is Lord Dolajan and G-R-N, and Moranar. When they released this boss, the entire collective community, spanning across multiple servers, with no access to Discord, things like that, all decided at once, fuck that, that's Lord Bob. Looking for group Lord Bob? Need healer Lord Bob. No, we're not typing that. No, the entire community, collectively, spanning every single server, all at once, said, no, we, we ain't saying that.
Find a bottle in a pond. Buy a wind chime. Capture some mist. Light a torch. Forge a sword. Pick a nettle. Find a leaf. Grab some bones. Read a very small book. Solve a riddle. Summon a ghost wolf. And finally cast sea invisibility to find a hidden scout. And all this takes about an hour and a half. And now the council has a new banner. On to the next quest. Romancing everyone. And to be fair, this is quite funny. A guy fancies a girl and sends you with a message. But she fancies somebody else. So sends you with a message. But they fancy somebody else. So sends you with a message. But they fancy somebody else. So sends you with a cake. And that person doesn't like cake. So throws it away. Which is great. <laughs> There's another quest where this dude attempts to poison the council member. But the councillor is immune to poison. So sends you back with a polymorph sheep potion to teach them a lesson. And now, finally, after I've sorted all the local problems and poisoned most people, we can begin the epic, ungodly long Serpent's Seeker's Charm of Law quest. Now this epic quest design of the Serpent's Charm I actually really like. The expansion pack The Serpent's Spine brings with it a load of new maps, enemies, and areas. And what this epic quest does is weave a narrative thread through absolutely all of them. There's a librarian in Crescent's Reach who needs you to find a load of rare items, about 30 of them, and they're all hidden in various maps. If you follow this achievement path, you'll be led through every single map, slowly progressing in difficulty, ending in a raid boss. And every item you find will power up an amulet that the librarian gives you, which is encouraging a player to explore and be curious about every map there in. I really wish more games had integrated systems like this. And now so when he said the word epic, uh, I was thinking about that. So EverQuest, um, when I played it, and again, I was like six, seven expansions in, there was a thing called the epic weapon. And I've heard it's advanced since then, and there's like second and third tiers of it now. But the epic weapons, there were different for every class. The druid had a scimitar with leaves swirling around it. The uh, I was a shaman. I had a thing called the Spear of Fate, and the spearhead would glow. And I mentioned earlier, if I pointed it at something and activated it, it fired a free dot that did 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, doubling damage until it had done a few thousand, then it would wear off. There was that one glitch where they reversed it for a week. Um, but every single class's thing, it was huge. The, uh, the, the mages. The mages epic was actually a spell that let them summon a combined elemental that was fire, earth, air, and water. It was all four. Um, and uh, because it was a spell, they could still use whatever gear they wanted. Whereas for other classes, their epic weapon was uh, a thing. I think the monk epic was like hand wraps or something because they would you know, punch the crap out of things. Uh, but the epic quests were like, ch chat, we're talking like a month. Like these quest lines were massive. It was like experiencing a small novel. Like you were going through a big adventure with an, as a narrative, like he said, and it would culminate in, you know, kill God <laughs> you know? or kill God's right hand man. Like the, the final thing I remember because I wasn't in a raid guild at the time. Uh, I, I ended up, uh, you know, contacting a guild. And I was like, hey, I need this one shaman quest item to finish my epic quest. I've done most of the rest of it in pugs. And I was like, do you guys have a waiting list? And they're like, yeah, we've got two more shamans who need that. So in three weeks, if you come with us this night and you stay out of the way and you do what we say, you can loot it. And I'm like, OK. And then uh, I did, dude, I went into the plane of fear with these people and they, they were fighting the God of fear and his henchmen. I, they were like, just stay out of the way. I'm like, okay. And the, the, I was just like you know, half dead. Oh my God, healing myself. I got feared. I went screaming and bashed my head into a tree and I stop and I'm like, I heal myself. I see enemies. I try to hide behind the tree. I get feared again. I like trip and fall down a ravine. Dude, I was just fighting earth while they were over there fighting God. And when it was over, I like stumbled over barely alive and got to loot my quest item. I was like, thank you. And I managed to, to finish my epic weapon. Now, again, that was the final step of like a month long project, but I was in no way ready for that. <laughs> Learn about places called Hot Zones, maps with increased experience or armor rewards for daily quests, but that's a level 20 thing, so we'll come back to that later because it might be useful for power leveling. Back to the desert, I need to kill some giant snakes, only issue is they are a rare spawn. You must kill a load of regular enemies and just hope a giant one spawns, and it takes literal hours to find them all. I even had to- Yeah, so imagine if the way that the rare the rares in this game work is every time, uh, okay, let's say uh, there's a skeleton. And it, it could be a place, it's like that spot where that skeleton is standing, whenever that mob respawns there, there's a 5% chance it'll be the rare spawn. Not all the skeletons, that specific skeleton. So that was referred to as a placeholder. So you would kill the placeholder, wait five minutes, another placeholder would spawn. Kill it, wait five minutes. You might spend three hours there. And eventually, by the grace of God, the guy that you want would spawn and you'd kill it. And I, uh, I specifically remember there was a, a quest line for an uh, item called the Paw of Apollo. Not important if you don't know what it is, if some of you might remember it. But the Paw of Apollo had, it was basically, there was like five different kill targets that were like that. 
to another map where the giant spawn is more common, but those ones don't count. I just grind for ages and finally hit level 15, which unlocks a load of new quests and Ghoul Hopper returns and happens to have found some more items I can use, and then I'm sent off to a farm to kill some undead and plant some flowers while I'm at it. Now I may Wait, also- Wait, you just hit 15? Ghoul Hopper was 19 like 30 minutes ago in the video. Josh, come on, step up. Be a good time to point out that I have rabies. It's a 45 minute long debuff, and I've also discovered that as a Shadow Knight, my tanking job is just repeatedly cast Life Tap, which steals the enemy's HP and refills mine. Slow, but extremely reliable, and I do very little damage. One of the issues with leveling a tank or a healer through EverQuest, especially solo, is you will take an absolute age to kill anything. And because the majority of your experience is granted through killing stuff, this is a very slow process. Yeah, um, I don't know about now, but back, back in the day, um, there was no quest turn in for XP, chat. It was just killing things. Turning in a quest yielded zero experience. A hundred percent of the XP you gained was genocide. So when you were like, all right, well, tonight I want to grind out some XP. I might be able to get 10% of my level uh, if I don't die and I join a group for a good couple of hours. Like, it was lots of murder. 30 minutes here, hit level 17, back to Crescent's Reach, and finally get sent to the third floor to kill an ogre ghost. So EverQuest, despite being slower than many modern gamers are going to be willing to put up with, it does have a great feeling of progression, and I love the touch of keeping Crescent's Reach densely packed with low, mid, and what feels like higher level quests as you progress through the city itself. The ogre ghost doesn't spawn, you have to shake his bones, but here's a fun thing. Shaking the bones starts a dialogue tree which ends with you saying, die, and then the fight starts. But if you just type die, the game registers that as the trigger phrase and spawns the boss immediately. The fight is fine, get me some green armor, exactly the same design, but but different color, which means it's better. And with this, I've done most of Crescent's Reach and can start the next map, the Moors, the foggy Scottish place. Kill rats, kill snakes, read about this thing called the Wayfarers Adventurers League, a system brought with the Lost Dungeons of Norath expansion. And that sounds great because I love dungeons in MMOs. So I spend ages trying to find the guild people and get involved in a dungeon, but I ask around and then read up and discover, yeah, the game has dungeons, but you can't do them solo. Maybe if I find someone later, I'll give it a go. And this is another example of an almost 25 year old game with almost 30 expansions. EverQuest has an absurd amount of content and combining all the start points into Crescent's Reach is great, but it doesn't mean much when players will leave Crescent's Reach and then just spread out all over the world, because most expansions have low-level and mid-level content too. They're almost like mini-contained adventures on their own. Starting EverQuest is intimidating, there's just so much to do. And the amount of players you would need to start this game all at the same time to make every single zone feel lively is just unrealistic today. But if you want to yeah. truly experience all of it or play the progression servers, you'll need to be a member. So let's have a look at membership. Remember the membership browser window opens automatically. So this is actually going to be new information for me because again, when I played the game, it was just $15 a month and that was it. You got everything. If you didn't pay $15 a month, you couldn't log in. Uh, it was like a similar to the modern day World of Warcraft subscription fee. Um, but let's see how it's changed. Every single time you camp or quit the game, so it's impossible not to see this. Membership is known as the Daybreak All Access Pass and gives you membership status on EverQuest 1 and 2, DC Universe Online, and Planet Side 2, so you're getting four games for the price of one. The prices range from $15 to $10 a month based on how long you sub for, but that's not all because you can augment your. Off topic, I could never get into Planet. I love Planet Side 1. I played a ton of it. I tried Planet Side 2 when it came out, and then I was just like, eh, this is not the same thing. I just, I just couldn't get into it. To each their own. I just, it wasn't for me. Monthly membership with perks. The Adventurer perk, which gives more experience, more coins, and raid currency. The Challenger perk, which gives discount in some shops, levels your mercenaries faster, and prevents you from losing experience on death. And the Merchant perk, which gives you more inventory space and bonus in crafting. One perk is an extra $3. Two perks is four, and all three of them for maximum augmentation is an extra $5 a month. And these perks are only in EverQuest 1. So when people say EverQuest isn't pay to win, it is now pay for an advantage. So subbing month by month with all perks would cost you $20 surprises me that you can pay to not lose XP on Dove a month. I don't like this. I think if you're going to have a monthly sub, make it fair for everyone. One standard monthly price where everyone knows exactly what they're getting. But there's more. You can also buy Daybreak cash and spend that in the in-game premium shop for things like an immediate level 100 boost to skip all this pesky leveling, more mercenary slots, or a trade skill depot to hold more skilling items. You can also buy Chrono, and I know this is a major point of contention with the community. A tradable item which adds 30 days game time to your account and costs $18 to buy. So it Oh, so it's like the WoW token twice as expensive as just buying membership for your account, but you can sell it to other players for in-game gold or items, sort of like RuneScape's bonds. This means you can't buy power directly from the shop, but you can buy a membership item and then sell them for gold and use the gold to buy whatever you need. Most people don't think of EverQuest when they think of a game that you can pay to win, but that might be the reality. Back to grinding, the EverQuest Discord advises I travel to a place called the Over There, a zone from the Kunark expansion, so I find a massive desert and kill a- uh, You still lose XP on death, but that perk won't let you de-level on a death. Oh, interesting, okay. 
cactus. It's honestly deeply saddening to see the massive remnants of a once great world now barren. It's a rather apt metaphor that I'm in the desert, a bastion of a once great civilization, now abandoned, crumbling, and run down, because that is very much EverQuest Live. Let's return to the Serpent's Charm epic fetch quest. It's not a dungeon per se, but it's got the same vibe. Fight through, find stuff, kill tons of zombies, finally hit level 20 and find all the epic items I can, and now back to the moors again. You know, thank god for the ground spawn markers on this map, because there is no way I would be able to find a tiny pile of rocks without this. Have a fight with a tree, and then see a lot of angry mushrooms decomposing a dragon, which is a pretty cool sight. Nice touch. If you stick to the roads in most areas, you won't be attacked. The next fetch quest is on a wasp farm, so I try to slowly and very carefully fight my way in, taking on just one enemy at a time, and oh my god, what the hell is that? There is a massive wandering boss wasp just wrecking me. That was actually extremely scary to pan the camera up and see. So by now, I'm at the point where super powerful enemies are just wandering around, which gives high-level players a reason to return to low-level maps, which is great, but also- Which is something I mentioned earlier. That was something they did, uh, like I, I gave the story about Terra Ranchola. There was occasionally, they would have a zone that'd be like level 15, but there'd be a level 30 enemy that would spawn there once an hour or once a day. Um, like there was a dock in I think the southern desert of Roe or the northern desert of Roe that had a sand giant that would periodically just spawn and people would scream for a high level player to come take it out so they could get back to their business. Gives low level players a goddamn heart attack when you lose half your health in one hit. I die here for the first legitimate time and I respawn where I bound my soul. I think that's the plane of knowledge. This is also rather prophetic because this wasp farm is the moment that solo play hits a bit of a soft cap. It I'm surprised his character is not naked. Uh, again, I'm, I talked about corpse runs earlier. Um, so he respawned and has all his gear. Maybe it has to do with the server he's on or the uh, subscription he did? In progression. I buy some more spells and realize another limitation. I now know both Clinging Darkness and Engulfing Darkness. They both apply a debuff to the enemy, but you can only apply one or the other and Engulfing is better. Thing is, the descriptions don't say does not stack with anything else. You just have to discover what stacks with what and what doesn't. Effectively, all damage over time spells can only have one version of themselves active. From fighting trees to fighting bushes, magical briar thorns, and these enemies are a fun time because they can heal themselves and others. So if you pull two of them, they'll just heal loop each other until- The thing with the darkness, yeah, it was kind of like a different rank of spell. Clinging darkness, engulfing darkness, devouring darkness, all of those. Uh, they would be like different tiers of the same spell. So you could only use the best one. But he's right, the tooltips didn't didn't say that. It was just at that, at that time, it was common knowledge. Um, short stories reminds me of is like my uh troll shaman shamans didn't have what was called a snare spell they had a root a snare spell would be something that reduces the target's movement speed and most living enemies when they got under like 10 percent, maybe 5 percent health they would try to run away but if they were snared they would try to run but their feet would be gummed up and they would literally not move at all but they were still in run mode and they wouldn't fight back and you could just kill them and they wouldn't fight back but if you rooted them the AI would be like, oh, I can't move, might as well fight. If you hit them with a root, even if they were feared or low health and trying to run, they would attack the nearest target. They, they would go for the nearest thing. Now, shamans did not have access to a true snare, but I found a line of quests in the game related to your religion. On the character creation screen, you could choose a god you worship. And at the time, I was like, I don't care. And I just picked one. I picked Inarok, the god of hate, because I was a troll shaman. Inarok had a troll shaman only quest line where you could get a necklace that fired the darkness spell from necromancers. So because I picked troll Inarok shaman, I couldn't have done this as any other type of shaman. I was able to use snare, even though my class shouldn't have been able to. And it was like little things like that. They were like really amazing to find in the game you run out of mana and then kill you. The only problem with high-level spells is I'm burning through mana faster and I'm spending more time sitting between fights. And the Hero's Journey guide now has way more stuff. Level 20 really is both a tipping point in content and solo difficulty. Now, it's unfair to say that EverQuest wastes your time, but I think it's fair to say it does assume you have a hell of a lot of time and will be spending all of it on EverQuest. It's heavily riding on yeah. the strength of the novelty of the online communication space and bringing people together, but that's not novel anymore. We've had that for years. It's very much pushing a special feature which most players won't find special. Project 99 has the hardcore difficulty and the charm of the 90s jank attracting the classic EverQuest crowd, and EverQuest Live is trying to have enough modern sensibilities and quality of life changes to attract the more modern crowd, but it doesn't quite have enough to pull people away from other modern games which do it better, which means EverQuest Live is caught in this awful void between two designs appealing to very few people. It's too fast-paced for the players that want the classic EverQuest experience, but it's not fast-paced enough to the players that want the modern MMO experience. It's not going to convince Project 99 players to jump over and join in, because it's not the game that they want anymore. But it's also not going to pull modern players playing more modern MMOs away from them, because it's just too grindy. It's just too 
too classic to be appealing to them, meaning you've got elements of both designs which aren't strong enough to appeal to either side. The Venn diagram of people who enjoy EverQuest Live is a very thin sliver between two otherwise quite large circles. Hit level 22 and take on the giant wasps, avoiding the wandering buzzer boss. These are 12% of the level per kill, so quite fast. Unfortunately, they are quite tough and they resist all of my debuffs, so I'm not weakening them. And because you only gain experience when a thing is successful, I'm not leveling magic either. Kill some ghost wolves, some briars, and hang on, I'm over level 20. That means hot zones, fast leveling areas. Oh, let's go. So hot zones used to be manually rotated by the game staff every patch, but now it's an automated process. And websites which used to keep up to date with the current live hot zone have long since given up tracking it. That should give you some indication on how little people care about leveling on live when you can just buy. So there used to be gosh i don't think hot zones were in the game when i played but there were a lot of uh speculation uh like there was a thing that people sometimes called hell levels like you know level 49 like breaking through from 49 to 50 for some reason took like triple the xp of going from 48 to 49 so there were things called hell levels that were like really tough to get through and there were some zones people were like i swear i'm leveling faster here but we didn't have any like concrete evidence on it so I wonder if these were in the game when I played it and there was just no one knew or if this was added later on. Either is possible. I level 100 boost. But if you chat to this NPC in the Plane of Knowledge, he'll tell you the active hot zone for your specific level. I'm told to go and kill five elephants in the Southern Plains. And the map link shows four connections. First off, find the Nexus. And now things get confusing. A new player. Oh, wow, I actually know this. This is on uh, Lukeland. The moon. This is on the freaking moon. Uh, so the Nexus, uh, again, has teleporters to a lot of different locations. This is unrelated to the plane of knowledge. Uh, I actually saw a mage murder a guy here. Uh, <laughs> so mages had a spell called mod rod, uh, modulation rod. And a mod rod, if you give it to a character and they use it, they consume it, it will lower their health and raise their mana. The amount was based on the level of the mage. Uh, so a max level mage giving a cleric a max level mod rod, let's say the cleric is like almost dry on mana, the tank's about to die, he could crush the mod rod and his health will go down a bit, his mana bar will shoot up and then he could keep healing the tank. So high level casters loved having a mod rod ready to go. Um, it didn't stop you from using this if you did not have enough health. And there was a mage I knew that would go up to, he was such a jerk. He would go up to like low level players and be like, oh, hey dude, you new to the game? Yeah, be like, oh man, summon some bandages. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Oh, summon, a, summon an armor that'll last until you log out. Oh, thank you. And he'd summon a mod rod. He'd be like, hey, you know, click this. It'll give you a buff. The guy would go, oh, thank you. Just explode. It just splatter all over the Nexus. So the, he would just convince people to take this thing and click it. And he would just, they would just die will find the Nexus a little bit obtuse. There are loads of NPCs who teleport you to places and some teleport pads which send you to random places, but the pads can have two destinations and you need to wait for the correct signal before stepping onto them, lest you be thrown halfway across the wrong side of the world. And the map find function does not like it here, and the NPC I needed was not shown. Thank God for the wiki. Now these old zones do have a certain polygonal charm to them. Welcome to the forest of Southern Karana. This map is massive and there's basically nothing here. A few trees, there's a hill, a and reference. almost no enemies. The irony is this is a hot zone, meaning increased experience. But finding anything takes so bloody long, I'm actually gaining less experience than if I just stayed in the moors killing angry bushes. So I consider going back to the moors, but this is another issue with EverQuest. Changing Traveling your mind time. in this game is a big time sink, because fast travel is mostly linked to high-level wizards teleporting you to places, or using the origin spell to recall to your start zone, or the odd return home button on the- Yeah, wizards and druids were taxes. What kind of a fool do you take me for? Why, is there more than one kind? Maybe. Wizards and druids, uh, you could tip them, and they would use some components that they had to pay for, and they could cast a spell that would teleport you to certain locations. There were certain zones that had a wizard spire or a druid ring that they could port a party to. Um, they also had a line of spells called evac, uh, or the, the community called them evac spells, where it was a really fast teleport, but just to the outside of the zone you're currently in. So if you were in a group and like the, the tank accidentally pulled too many mobs and he's like, we're going to die evac, is the, the goal would be like, keep the enemy off the druid for 10 seconds and the druid would just port the whole party outside. Um, yeah, so there there was teleports to these locations like he's talking about. Those of you that play Guild Wars 2, like me, you know, we currently uh, have a waypoint system. We can open up the world map and click on any of these diamonds to port there. No, 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 no. EverQuest, imagine you're here and you want to go there. You got to walk. You got to walk. That was EverQuest.
I'm not bragging about it, that's just how it was, but again, it was a social thing. Like, Ocean of Tears was a zone that was almost completely water and islands, and the boat that would go from one end to the other took 45 minutes to go in trips. So you might be waiting for that boat, and by the time you got off on the other end, you either really liked or really hated the people that were on that boat with you. And your fishing skill was probably higher. Only count to select screen, which can be used every 20 minutes. Basically, getting somewhere in EverQuest is a task in itself. So arriving anywhere once you've spent 15 minutes getting to it and then deciding against it and wanting to go somewhere else 15 minutes away is a half hour gaming session where you've made no actual progress. The most efficient way to play EverQuest is to stay in one place and grind the same enemies until you level up and then move to a slightly harder place, which is the antithesis of massive adventure, loads of variety, do whatever you like that the hardcore fans like to push. Basically, you're encouraged to stay wherever you are. And it takes me 35 minutes to find five elephants and I just return to the moors and kill mushrooms. It's fascinating. I Google around for some guide and find a seven-year-old Reddit post which is mostly still accurate. Grind some more mushrooms and then swat some wasps until level 25 and now my mercenary has evolved into Wolverine. So I kill some fairies and the wiki tells me that the boss wasp drops a decent chest armor, but it's a very low chance and I still can't kill it. Hand in more librarian epic quest items and die to more angry bushes and my next task takes me into the foggy crater in the center of the moors and this place is way too dangerous for me. At this point, I do take a brief look at trying to play Project 99, but that's a whole video in itself sometime because even getting that running is a task. Kill a wolf boss and now I'm realizing the contradicting design which is holding EverQuest Live back. If you're going to play live, you need to be at the end game, which means you need to grind, which itself is a lonely, quite boring journey. You want to gain fa- uh, So Archsmith and Twitch chat says, do you remember Enchanters sitting by the small bank in Plane of Knowledge asking for tips for mana regen buff? Yes. So Enchanters could cast a spell on spellcasters called Breeze at level 16, and I believe Clarity at level 32, and I believe at around level 60 they got Key, K-E-I, Kodiak's Endless Intellect, gave you vastly higher mana regen for like an hour. And the thing was, I was a shaman. Shamans had the best martial buffs in the game. They, they had like uh, fox's agility and cat's cunning and bear's strength and uh, ox's stamina. They, like, they could do a whole bunch of stat buffs and also Spirit of the Wolf. Spirit of the Wolf, or so as the community called it, increased your run speed by like 35% or something. Bro, enchanters wanted to be tipped for casting key on people. They would sit in town and just be like, you know, but you're know, casting key for tips. People would come up, I, would, I never asked for them because I, I didn't sit in one place that long. People would come up and be like, hey, can I tip you for so? I'd be like, sure. And they'd usually just hand me a platinum and I'd cast so on them. Uh, enchanters and uh, shamans like myself or druids could also cast so. We, dude, we would just <laughs> high five each other. We would, we would pass one another. He'd slap me with a mana regen. I'd slap him with a run speed buff. It, would just, it was just free trade every time. Like, we, we, we got along great. Fast experience, which means mindless grind. But you're also told, Muckery living here. What? <laughs> One of my patrons that we were also told sublime. Uh, Mercury living is uh, teens. No, no, no. I don't have uh, as much acne anymore. Itself is a lonely, quite boring journey. You want to gain fast experience, which means mindless grind. But you're also told take the journey slow, immerse yourself, which means reading all of the quest text and talking to all the NPCs, which takes absolutely bloody ages, which doesn't get you any closer to being social. The strength of the game. Yeah. So your choice is mindlessly grind, which is efficient, which will get you to the good bit faster, but is itself boring, or immerse yourself into the game and enjoy the journey as everyone keeps telling you to, knowing that that's going to take you months to get to the end game and actually join the players that you want to join in the first place. EverQuest wants to be a slow paced grindy game, but then has all of the fun stuff at the end, which is slow and grindy to get to. Get sent to investigate a mine, get attacked through a tent because enemy aggro rangers aren't blocked by thin walls, and then kill a ticking croc. Oh my god, I don't know if it's changed, but when I last played this game, enemies attacking you only measured the horizontal plane. What I mean is, is an enemy AI could be 40 feet above you in a treehouse, and if you, if, like, if, here's the two of you, if he's up here, he could hit you. They didn't measure vertical distance. They only measured horizontal distance. So that was a problem. There was these bird people, I, I don't know, aviacs or avians or something like that. Uh, it was kind of like Tengu from Guild Wars 2. Uh, they had tree houses and it was notorious having that issue there where you'd be like under the tree house and you'd be shooting it, trying to get it to come down and it would just hit you through the floor. 
crocodile in a swamp because now we are Peter Pan. More crocodiles are now level 28, and this is the first Collect X quest where the item dropped isn't a 100% guaranteed drop, in this case crocodile skin, so now we're going to be here a while. Wait for nighttime to kill some witch lamps, which means waiting about 25 minutes, and finally I find a shop which sells better backpacks. I've also got this item, a tier of wandering souls. It's an augment item, so I stick it into something else I'm wearing, and then I get another tier drop, but I'm told nope, you can only have one at a time. Fight into the magical moors crater, and now EverQuest becomes Silent Hill. Look for the item I need and get ambushed by a witch mini boss and just wrecked. One problem with fights is you can tell pretty quickly if you're going to win or lose, and if you know you're going to lose, the only way to escape is zoning or running to another zone, which takes a minute or two. At a high enough level, you can also play dead, but I don't have that skill yet. This pickaxe quest line sends me back and forth. Yeah, uh, monks have a skill called Feign Death, uh, which later Hunters and WoW got that skill, so many of you probably know it. Um, Necros and Shadow Knights have a rather than a martial ability to play dead, they have a spell that makes them uh, look like they're dead. Um, but that's what he mentioned he doesn't have yet. So his Shadow Knight will eventually get that, but later he won't. Uh, quick story about pulling. So monks were the best pullers in the game. So imagine you you find a spot, um, lots, lots of monsters there, maybe one rare mob that spawns every 10 minutes with a chance to drop a big money item. And your group's like, let's set up camp here, just kill everything that respawns around us in the area. And you would send out your monk, hopefully you had a monk, and he would run out throw a knife at something and run back. But he accidentally gets three things. Your group can't handle three things. So on his way back to the group, he'll feign death. And the things will all look at him and one at a time, they would walk away. And once there was only one enemy left and it's about to walk away, the warrior in the group would run up and get its attention and pull it back. Once the other two had finished resetting, the monk would pop back up and come back and join the group. So you would uh, do what was called peeling. So the monk would feign death pull and then you would wait until all but one had left, and then the other group would peel off of that. Now, the stuff after it had reset would go back to its spawn point. There was a problem in a zone called the Temple of Vishon, uh, or Vishon's Pink, what, P Vishon's Peak. One of the two of those names, I knew of it. It was legendary on my, on the, in the game at that time. Um, uh, High-end Scars of Elias content. Uh, the zone was just full of dragons. It was all dragons. It was, it was a, the architecture was built for dragons. It was dragon sized. The hallways were absolutely massive. Um, you zoned in with a teleporter. The dragons did not have a coded spawn point. Um, there was two guilds uh, that were trying to fight over doing this place at the same time. And it was not a PVP server, but they kept trying to steal each other's kills. And this is end game stuff. And they went in there, they, they teleported in and guild A, their monk went in, pulled like five dragons when Guild B wasn't ready, plus it was five of them, and ran to them and feigned death. And was just like, hey guys, bleh, and just fell over. And these dragons began massacring this guild. Uh, imagine, those of you who know uh, World of Warcraft, imagine you're in Molten Core and some guy just comes running up to your group with like five core hounds and you're not ready, but you can't zone out yet. It was a teleporter to enter not a hallway. So they're fighting for their life. They all die. And again, in this game, when you die, your gear stays on your corpse until you can retrieve it. Um, these dragons don't walk away. They have no set spawn point. They all sit at the entrance. Chat after hours of trying everything they could think of, this guild, this top guild in the game, with their whole raiding community butt naked, had to basically wait until the following server reset. They had to wait a week to get their stuff back. They had to wait until the server reset and then they were able to go in because the dragons weren't at the entrance anymore to get all their gear back to play. Or someone looted your corpse. And in this situation, they couldn't because the dragons were all at the entrance. If you zoned in, you immediately got killed. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> all right, story time over. From the moors to Crescent's Reach four times, and by now I'm 50 hours in, and I feel like I've seen about five hours worth of interesting content. EverQuest Live has a lot of stuff, but it's all very stretched out, padded with big open spaces and the drawn out fights. And if you're thinking, this doesn't seem like 50 hours worth of journey, believe me, I've cut a lot of drawn out fights and so much travel. Into the mind for some rare ore, and the camera struggles in tight spaces. In fact, it struggles in general. If you want to look at your character from slightly above and mostly see the floor, you are fine. EverQuest specializes in that. I find a new weapon, a great axe. It's a two handed weapon, which means losing my shield, but the best defense is killing the enemy faster. So let's do this. Why you're on this pickaxe quest, you must equip the magical pickaxe to gather ore from these rocks, and that gives you a cool lightning bolt effect whenever you attack, and then it's back to Crescent's Reach and kill trees and finally hit level 30. EverQuest is not really designed to be a game you log into and enjoy when you've got a spare hour or so, maybe even two or three on the weekends. It's designed to be 
your thing, your hobby. You need to know so many keybinds, shortcuts, travel routes. It's built to be the MMO you play. And back when it was the MMO that everyone played, this worked amazingly. But now with more casual, friendly MMOs, only the real hardcore enfranchised EverQuest fans remain. And it's lagging behind, because EverQuest as it is is simply too big a game for a small player base. It's not a bad game, and it's an extremely important game, but it's not a game built to succeed in today's MMO landscape. I ask in the Discord about team content, there's gotta be something I can do in a group now. And I'm told, to speed up solo play, new gear called Defiant was added to the game. I'm actually using some Defiant stuff already. Defiant gear is basically better than anything else you could find, even from a group boss. So there isn't really much of a point grouping up in the early or mid levels for content. You only really do it for the social aspect. It won't get you better equipment. Comments in the Discord say, if I want to see people low or mid level, I need to go onto a progression server. So I will try that soon. I kill some giant zombies, each takes four minutes to kill and get chased by an entire forest. And then my notes say something rather prophetic. You see, while I'm playing games, I handwrite my notes and then I turn those notes into a script. And the note for now, the 55th hour of gameplay just reads, not excited anymore. I think I wanted EverQuest to be the adventure everyone had always told me that I was looking for, that they had, this grand, epic, unparalleled online world. I think I was expecting the Elvis concert they went to, but it's not the one that I can go to. EverQuest was fun, yeah, but just like stupid. radio was incredible for the time and color TV was incredible for the time, we're not in those times. Yeah, it's a different time. Like again, it, when each fight, especially as a low level melee, is just like auto attack and wait, and then after that, you sit down for a few minutes and wait on your health to come back. Like, this would be something that you would play while you're watching Netflix on the other screen or something. Like, this would be an activity I would do while I'm doing two or three activities. Like, this is, it's just not enough. Um, and then uh, also, like, the, the group thing. Uh, there, there's still some interesting classes and stuff like that. For example, a bard. A bard um, has a, a, a special method of kiting that they can do where they basically can play one song where they run faster and another song that damages everything around them by a small amount. Imagine that they just piss off 50 things and run in circles with those two songs going and eventually they kill all that stuff and then they just gain like a full level up each time. Uh, yeah, that's bard kiting. Very dangerous. Kills everybody else nearby. But, you know, they can do that on their own. Uh, Shadow Knight is okay. I mean, he's got the mercenary too. Shadow Knight's not the best solo or by a stretch. But again, the, the game has just changed. I mean, you're talking about a game that doesn't even have maps on some of the zones. Uh, it doesn't have a quest log. Well, I guess it sort of has a quest log now since they added one later on, but originally did not. Um, you, know, you have to talk to the NPCs. It's just, it's definitely not something that modern players are into. Completely agree with that times anymore. Expectations have advanced with what we now consider standard, and the EverQuest experience is like taking a kid raised on the goriest and most violent modern-day horror films and making them watch Dracula because it scared you as a kid, then wondering why they aren't as scared as you were. EverQuest is undeniably- My kid loves Five Nights at Freddy's, that would be the same. A great foundation, but the stuff we've built on top of this foundation is so damn impressive, the whole genre has changed. Look, I'm 55 hours into EverQuest Live. It's sprawling, it's padded with back and forth quests. I'm squinting to read the text and click the blue boxes. I'm trying to push myself to take on higher enemies and test my tanking skills, but death means experience loss, and it's taken a while to get back, so I'm playing defensively. Even Ghoulhopper has surpassed me as he's a DPS-focused necromancer, so solo play for him is faster. I don't think 45 more hours is going to change my opinion of EverQuest Live, because people keep telling me it gets good at level 100. That's where the newer expansions want the player base to be, and getting there will take weeks as a solo player. 55 hours has got me here. I've met one other player, and even then we don't need to team up. So for the last 40 five hours, I decided I should try out a progression server, and this means subscribing for at least a month. So I sign up for a month of membership and start a new Lizard Necromancer on the Oakwind progression server, the newest one. This server hasn't yet reached the Serpent Spine expansion, so there's no Mines of Glooming Deep or no Crescent's Reach starting zone. I do love this though. When you start a new character, you can choose to copy your UI layout from another character so you don't need to rearrange everything. Game starts, we are dumped into the Lizard Necromancer Tower with no real direction, and I cannot overstate this. The only reason I have any idea what to do is because I went through the Glooming Deep tutorial on live. If this was my first exposure to the game, I would be completely lost. If learning to play EverQuest live with yep, it just drops you into the world and it's like, good luck tutorial was like learning how to fly a plane with a manual, this is an older plane and the manual was lost years ago. There's no hero's journey, no achievement guide, and I accidentally cast life tap onto a guard and then get killed. I respawn in a brand new place with no money and the only way to- <laughs> Did you see how fast that was? There was like one frame he was alive and the next frame he was not. Level up at this point in the game's lifespan is just to grind. Currently, this server is on the Scars of Velius expansion, so I find- Remember what I told you that people accidentally like typing without the text box open and they hit A and they'd auto attack a guard? It's that fast. And a guide specifically for that and follow as best I can. Grind, buy spells, can't find bone chips. Then it seems ladders just don't work. Well, turns out they kind of do, but only when you approach them in first person. I am, however, noticing my mana refills a lot slower, so there's even more sitting between fights. I make it to the field of bone and I keep grinding, and honestly, I'm just lonely. The nostalgia people have for MMOs where you need a team often skip over the parts where your team isn't online and you can't do anything. I even try a new class on the same server, a magician, and I actually really like the elemental pet summoning dynamic. They tank for you while you sit at the back healing them and throwing massive damage out. I explore the mage's tower, which is this 
grand magical area with teleporters from level to level, then I try and summon an elemental pet, but you need Malachite. But nowhere does it tell you this. You only know when you try to cast the spell and fail. There's no hero's journey here either, and very few, if any, quests from NPCs, and even if you could find them, they actually don't get recorded to your quest journal. You just need to go and grind. And this style clearly appeals to people because the tunnel in the common lands, the trading post, is packed. But oh my god, yeah, okay, so uh, originally Q had no trading post, no auction house, nothing like that. There was a, the community kind of decided the tunnel in the Eastern common lands, this big tunnel. Uh, that was the trade hub. They just decided that. So you would have a whole bunch of people there and they would, uh, there's, there's torches along the walls and they'd be like, you know, you're selling flung black silk sash, third torch. And then you know, if you wanted it, you'd go to that spot and you'd find them and be like, you know, you know work with them. Sometimes they would, uh, you'd have low level players too. And it was interesting because, uh, low level players, um, could kill things like skeletons and get bone chips. Max level necros needed bone chips by the truckload to summon their pets, just like low level necros did. They didn't want to go farm skeletons. So max level necro would give you like, mm, here's a coin to the low level guy. And the low level guy would be set for a week with that amount of money. So you'd have a, a pretty cool economy where the low level people would farm like, you know, bat wings and bone chips and stuff and sell it to the high level people. And they'd make, uh, you know, what was for their level a ton of money and they'd be set for a long time. Uh, but yeah, there was you know, trading required actually trading. There was there was no automated system for it, and uh, there was a bizarre thing that was added sort of in Lukelin, but even that was kind of archaic. But it seems that everyone here already knows what to do, and that's the crux of it. EverQuest, as it is now, is filled with people who already know how to play EverQuest and enjoy the experience, because they've gone through the learning process. If you join now, the learning process is brutal. Hey look, Secret Wall. Secret Walls are always cool. Now, buying membership gave me eight character slots, so maybe this just isn't the character or server for me, because I am enjoying the gameplay of the Magician, but I feel that if I started after the Serpent's Spine and I had Crescent's Reach to latch onto, I would enjoy it more. Thankfully, I can do that, so I re-roll as a Magician on the Mischief server, another progression server, but further along. Now, Mischief is also one of the most populated servers, because it is a random random loot server, so almost any boss can drop any item. So I rush the Glooming Deep tutorial on a magician, which takes about three hours, now I know what I'm doing, and this player Grom says he'll only believe it's me if I put this in the video, so hi Grom, and then with a mercenary, a pet, and a magician DPS, I'm finally <laughs> hi, throwing Grom. out some decent damage, although I've only realized I've accidentally made myself Ginger Spock. Oh, cool. <laughs> Live long and prosper, Josh. Well, you can give the magician's elemental pets weapons and it will hold and use them, that's kind of adorable. Yes. Again, uh, you, you give something a weapon, uh, and you know, funny thing, some weapons are lower DPS than their fists. So sometimes if you summon a, uh, a pet, a skeleton, uh, if you're a necro or one of the elemental summons, if you're a mage and you give it a weapon, you can actually lower its damage. But the, the best ones were in Velius. uh, at least when I played in Velius, there were trash items called, they were like Velium swords and they all procced an ice attack. So it's like chance on hit ice blast. So having a pet with a couple of these like trash tier Velium swords would do a whole bunch of ice blasts and stuff, which was a lot of fun. It was very flashy for just like, a pet attack. Um, and then on the topic of the elemental pets, the, the earth pet could root enemies uh, randomly. The air pet I think would interrupt enemies. Uh, I think water was just well-rounded. I don't remember if it did anything specific. And then the fire one had a damage shield. It would set itself on fire. And if anyone had hit it, they would get burned. Hit level 10 pretty bloody fast and get to Crescent's Reach. Now, I'm about 60 hours into playing this actual game, but there is a moment where the UI starts to make sense, when you feel like you're actually flying the plane instead of trying to wrestle the controls and not- I will say when I play, like, he has every single bag and his, uh, his stat sheet open 100% of the time, which is totally fine. When I played, I, I, I did not keep this open. I didn't keep these open. I didn't keep the map open. I just opened the map when I needed the map. Uh, or, you know, I had paper maps. And then, like, the size of everything else was kind of increased to compensate. Like, my spell gems were much larger on the left-hand side, stuff like that. But again, the UI, you could... It was very flexible. You could move around stuff as much as you wanted. Just crash. EverQuest gives you a huge amount of depth and control and freedom and build to play with, but just does a terrible job of introducing it. But when you do feel confident with the freedom you have, when you know how the map works, you feel strangely at home. I don't bother doing any of the quests because I know they're slow experience, because the walking to and from the quest givers is just not efficient. I just grind, and the magician gets elemental pets every few levels, and all the spells of a sail in the plane of knowledge, so I'm popping back there every few levels to buy the latest and greatest, and I discover the water elemental is the only one worth summoning, and my god it can hold its own. There's even a berserk spell which empowers your pets for an hour, so meet Conan the Angry Water Spirit. At level 15 I get a spell which summons magical throwing daggers into my own inventory, and now an issue with ranged attacks. Melee has auto attack. Range does not. If you have a ranged weapon equipped, you must click for every attack you wish to make. The only way to get around this is to make a social macro which types slash auto every time you click it, because typing slash auto turns on or off ranged auto attacks. But
I've never it, from my time in EverQuest, I never even met a mage that would do throw that would do throwing. I, one, I didn't even know they could summon throwing daggers. Um, I knew that like monks would use those to pull. It was just like a ranged attack they'd fire one time just to get a mob's attention. Um that's interesting that he that's actually really cool. So that he he was trying to use it as like a source of uh, damage, um, but then he hit a problem with the UI. But this is not as standard. Why? Speed level as fast as I can, and to put the spells into perspective, the burn spell does 14 damage, but Firebolt, a few levels higher, does 261 damage. Magicians are basically nukes, and the challenge here is managing the aggro. Buy some jewelry, and I've yeah. reached level- The wizard was the king of nukes. Like, casting, 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 you just lost 80% of your health. Mage was almost as good, but then they had the, the summons and the make something out of nothing and all that stuff. Oh, and wizards also had the teleports. 18 in only six hours. EverQuest is a game that you need to already know well to progress with any speed in. Mostly I just sit down and send my pet in. General chat by now has devolved into people talking about conspiracy theories, as general chat often does, and I'm given some advice. Cast Shield of Flame on my tanking mercenary and my pet, and enemies will take damage every time they hit them. That's right. Mages had uh, really good uh, reflect damage spells. Uh, thorns, as they're often called in uh, modern games. You cast it on uh, something, and any time that thing gets hit, the attacker would take some damage. And my god, this works so well. Another player called Beatboxer offers me some more advice and then sends me some platinum to kit myself out with spells and armor, so thank you for that because it does come in really helpful. Eventually I just head back to the moors, spend hours grinding, give my pets some cool little summon swords, and I'm still lonely. EverQuest has a community. It's not big, but it's there. The issue is, while other MMOs have you surrounded by people, letting you play alone within a crowd, which some people enjoy, EverQuest very rarely has you in any group situation that you've not actively sought out yourself. You might see people in towns, but the vast majority of this game is in open maps by yourself. Uh, as of Mage Main, I was used back then for Call of the Hero, Reflect, and Damage. Koth. Oh, I forgot about Koth. Call of the Hero? Uh, it was Warlock Summoning Stone. W World of Warcraft's War uh, with <laughs> World of Warcraft's Warlock Summoning Stone, uh, was basically Call of the Hero. The Mage could summon someone far away to them. So if you were in, like, really deep in a dungeon and Billy had to leave, and someone new joins the group and they're at the entrance, the Mage could pull, you know, teleport you down to the group. Elf. To use the auction house, by the way, you must type slash bazaar, and then you can buy stuff and have it delivered straight to you if you use premium currency or to a post box in game. I grind until strangely I hit the same soft wall, the moors, and the stone hive. I just can't progress through this alone, so I guess it's time to group up. Everyone tells me EverQuest is about being social, so I ask on the Discord and in game, and I meet Red. Red is a bard, one of the classes that is awful at soloing, but put them in a group and they are an absolute beast. Red and I go wasp hunting. I'm recovering. Ma Red, okay, so bards can solo, but it, there's definitely, again, I mentioned it, they need a lot of space, and it takes them forever to kill something, but they can kill 50 things in the same amount of time that they can kill one thing, but if they get hit, they're dead. So it, it's basically, they, they run high speed while playing a screeching song that does like five damage per tick, until eventually everything in the middle of that, you know, bard tornado, you know, dies from the music. <laughs> Uh, but uh, bards were the kings of groups. Uh, they had a song they could play that made you regenerate health faster, a song that made you uh, regenerate mana faster, uh, a song that made your run speed go really f uh, really high if you needed to run away, um, songs that slowed down enemies if they were trying to run so that they didn't aggro more stuff, um, songs that boosted stats. Like, they were, they were a true Swiss Army Knife. Mana faster because of his songs, he's holding aggro better, our mercenaries are tanking like champions because I'm casting flame shield on everything. We even go item hunting. He didn't know about the achievements page or the epic item quest, so I show him that, and someone else shows me to set my mercenary to main tank, which holds better aggro. I help him download Bray War maps. He summons a jester minion, which turns me into a snake. You know, standard stuff. We <laughs> even make it into the hive together, cheesing this maze puzzle by jumping over the top of it, but then getting lost on the way back. We spend a good six to eight hours killing things together, and then onto a new map where neither of us had been, the Mesa. And then we agree to chat on Discord. The problem is, when I jump back on the game later, he's not there, the slow grind returns, the frequent death, the lonely world. So I hit him up on Discord to see if he's free. And that's when it hit me. When I connected with another player, the very first thing we both did was find a way to connect together outside of the game, on Discord. EverQuest used to be able to rely on the strength of, you can talk to people, this is a social space, this is the community in itself. All the players were within the game and within the collected community. But yeah, uh, as mentioned before, um, what, when I played EQ uh, back in the first few expansions, I don't even think Ventrilo and TeamSpeak were really big then. Like, I think th they might have existed, but they were y young. Discord certainly did not. So you, you would add people to your friends list and maybe see them uh, when you know, they'd next log in if you happen to be on at the same time. That was most of it. But now they're in the game, but the community exists elsewhere. 
There's no doubt that EverQuest is a platform that will allow a large group of players to go on an epic adventure, but it will not provide you with any of that unless you provide the players, the time, and the conversation that makes the epic adventure worth going on. EverQuest fans and long-term players will, of course, think I'm being unfair to the game, and I'm not saying the game wasn't incredibly- No, no, this all sounds pretty spot on. ...important for the time. It pretty much defined what the genre could be. It gave us a really good starting point to build off. But going back to it now, judging it purely mechanically, the gameplay alone, without the masses of players that make the experience fun, it's really struggling to stand up, and it's really struggling to hold a new generation of players. Modern MMOs have so many in-game systems to facilitate you playing with other people, which is their strength. Friends lists, guilds, invites, looking for groups, party finders, teleporter clan events. It's easy to stay in them while finding people within them. EverQuest, however, does have a friends list, but you won't even know who's online or not until you try and message everyone individually. Its strength is definitely in group play, and yet it's not an easy game to find a group to play with. It's uh, I wonder if he is mistaken on that or if they changed it. I remember adding people to friends list and at any time you could type slash who all friend and then it would show you a list of friend of your friends and it would say either offline or it would say the zone they were in um and then you could message them you didn't have to like you know spam all of them especially as a new player the fact you've got live progression and project 99 divides the player base down and more divisions come with every new server it's less a centralized player base within one game and more a community of people who enjoy the experience of replaying parts of that game every few months don't feel guilty if you're not impressed by everquest because the genre has moved on did it get good 100 hours in it definitely got better but most of that getting better was provided by having other people to play with it's less a game and more of a long-term hobby so try it admire it appreciate what it represents and the history behind it but don't expect a modern MMO experience, in community or in pacing. EverQuest is absolutely one of the best foundations the MMO genre could have asked for, but like all foundations, it's been built on and over by others. EverQuest had its time to shine, and while it's still undeniably enjoyable for those who want to remember the old days or those who have thousands of hours to put in, for the newer MMO player, Elvis has, unfortunately, left the building. But cheers for watching. Another massive thank you to the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep this channel alive and allow me to put 100 hours into a game before reviewing it. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. And as always, have a great day. All right. So once again, that was I Played EverQuest for 100 Hours Should You from Josh. And there in the chat is the link to that. But yeah, I mean, hard to agree. I wanted to go over this because, again, for me, uh, you know, I've got a whole stack of cases and stuff behind me just to show. Uh, this that was this is where it started for me. This is where I got into my first MMO. I was in EverQuest for like seven years, and then I played EverQuest 2 for like a year. I played World of Warcraft for like 10 years. I dabbled in Black Desert Online, Elder Scrolls Online, Final Fantasy XIV, uh, and just tons of others. And then the last five years I've been on Guild Wars 2 for the most part. Um, but this is like definitely where my addiction started. I've been waiting for him to, uh, to cover this game, uh, as someone who's been enjoying his worst MMO ser ever series, but it was cool. It was cool that he actually put in a hundred hours into it just to shut up the people that always say play it for a hundred hours. But yeah, EverQuest was a fun game. I, you know, it inspired a lot of the stuff that you see in world, like one of World of Warcraft's most famous bosses, Anixia was like a copy-paste of Lord Nagafen, a red dragon in EverQuest. Literally the same mechanics. The, 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 co the cleave, the tail swipe, the fire breath, the, the eggs, like all of that stuff. It was Lord Nagafen. Like there was so much stuff that WoW copied from EverQuest, but they made it more easily digestible by a larger audience. And it didn't require you to, you know, feel like you learned a new, uh, what, what was his metaphor? The, the controls to an old airplane to be able to play the game. They made it much easier to just dive in and enjoy. Plus the fact that you could play WoW on a potato and it worked just fine. Uh, so you know, they, they made it much more approachable, which you know, slowly drained a lot of the EverQuest player base at that time period. But this was awesome, and you know, shout out to Josh who uh, you know gave me the green light to go ahead and do this. It was a lot of fun, and it was a nice trip down uh, memory lane. A lot of cool times there. All right.